Hey everybody, I'm Jesse. And I'm Landon, also known as Pope DARPA. And this is Boring Conversation. Welcome to Boring Conversation, a Malifaux podcast. And welcome back to Boring Conversation, everybody. Uh, today, I am joined by the one, the only, the Pope with the most i guess we could probably come up with a better one than that but anyway landon what's going on bud well you know just enjoying a lovely beer out of my captain <laughs> con creators invitational 2023 glass so doing all right yeah actually it's kind of cool the um the captain con folks just sent out the first email and asked us if we were going to be putting on the same events for next year. So I haven't responded, but the answer is yes. I will definitely be doing the Content Creators Invitational and the Open Tournament again, just like I have in years past. So very much looking forward to that. And uh, let's just i mean, dive right into it. Obviously, you know, we're both here today to talk about something that I've been looking at talking about for a very, very long time. But before we let that cat out of the bag, if you haven't already guessed it from the episode title, um, do you have anything that you would like to plug, Landon? Well, if you don't already, go ahead and uh, watch us on Danger Planet. Myself and uh, Haku team up with Doug, Sam, and Brandon to put out tierless content, which is not really tierless, but more just us riffing on models and rating them, you know? Um, so tune on in if you have aren't familiar with us. Yeah, it's a really fantastic channel. And uh, I, I particularly enjoy um, listening to the tier lists, especially because I have quite a lot of driving and commuting with my my job. And uh, I, I find that listening, especially to the tier lists, is a lot more fun than listening to podcasts for hours upon hours every single day. Um, and I don't now that YouTube actually lets me like kind of semi minimize it so I can actually like look at my GPS and stuff while I'm watching so much the better how about that uh definitely one of my favorite channels and i know the channel's also been doing some other content for a couple of other game systems so definitely check it out uh, i myself uh, don't really have any big plugs aside from captain con which i already just mentioned um me and landon were both talking kind of before we started recording and uh, we are actually both going to be going to the nova open is that not correct landon Yep, I'll be there playing for the title. Nice. I will be playing for a solid midfield finish. It'll be very exciting. Uh, this is actually the first event that I have traveled to um, as a participant since the TFL or Total Foe League finals back in like second edition uh, that Chris oh, and Tina put on. Super, super fun. But I've mostly been like TOing since then. Uh, or I had very young kids and it was difficult for me to uh, take, you know, long trips. This is the first year that I have told myself after many years and I'm going to go to Nova that I'll actually be going. Uh, and in addition to that, I am going to be going to the Houston GT or the Lone Star um, Fodown, I think is what Doug is calling it. Um, that that happens right. to be my birthday weekend, too. How about that? I'll be flying oh. out there on my birthday. Well, happy birthday. I haven't decided if I'm coming down yet to crush here or not, but there's going to be so many people there. It feels like it's almost a mistake to not go. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that Doug's goal of making it the uh, biggest Malifaux tournament, like the, big, the biggest standalone Malifaux tournament of the year is, is a great, great one. Um, he's doing a fantastic job at promoting it. And I know that there's a lot of folks from all across the, the kind of, spectrum of play that are going to be there i'm really looking forward to going down and playing what quite frankly has been my favorite faction now for a little while and we're actually going to talk about some of them tonight uh, and that is 10 thunders 
Uh, I'm going to be playing Bayou at the Nova Open, and I've decided that unless I get a real wild hair up my ass and decide to go like solo Ivan for the Houston GT, which is probably a terrible idea, um, that I will be playing Thunders. And the master that we're going to be talking about tonight is most assuredly going to be in my bags for the event. Uh, but before we get into that, Landon, what are you drinking tonight, sir? So today I am drinking Off Color Brewing's Deca beer. It's a farmhouse ale mix. Nice farmhouse ales. Like I've actually on the last two episodes, I think I was drinking saisons, which are basically like Belgian farmhouse ales, some kind of French farmhouse ales, and uh, it's definitely one of my favorite styles, and for sure. Uh, a great one for the summertime. Uh, today was the, actually the hottest day of the year so far here in Massachusetts. I was beating the pavement around Boston in a balmy 98 degree weather with like ridiculous humidity. Um, so today I opted for an Oberon American Wheat Ale by Bell's Brewing, which happens to be one of my favorite summer beers out there. Very different from a farmhouse, uh, but kind of a perennial favorite of mine. And uh, yeah. I'm happy that we can get bells here in Massachusetts now. Like I was telling you before the recording, uh, I was a huge fan of bells kind of when I had my craft beer, like awakening when I lived in mid state Michigan for a couple of years, uh, quite some time ago. And, uh, we, I couldn't get it for a long time after we moved back to Massachusetts, it just, it wasn't available in mass or any other of surrounding States. So now I can get it and happy as can be. It's a Midwest classic. It's a Midwest classic. Bell's Two-Hearted, still probably one of my top five favorite beers of all time. Great stuff. But enough about the beer. We've talked about Ten Thunders. We've talked about a master, and we've buried the lead long enough. So what are we talking about today, Landon? Last Blossom is what we're here to talk about. So Misaki 1, Misaki 2, and everything she comes with. Hell yeah. So... I, I know that kind of on the podcast and various other social media platforms, I've been sort of espousing the virtues of Misaki for a while. When I decided that I was going to make the swap from uh, Bayou into another faction, um, basically shortly after Explorer Society came out, I did like a solo Ivan kick for quite some time and had a lot of success with him. But he was the only master that really seemed to click with me within the faction. So I had a tough time saying that I was going to like switch to ES for a long time. So ever since second edition, uh, Misaki and your favorite boy over there, Jacob Lynch, were actually the masters that I almost started playing the game with. It was like a real near miss. Um, I ended up kind of veering left into Ophelia, uh, mostly because my friend that was teaching me how to play the game told me how much he hated Bayou and he hated Gremlins and he thought that they were a terrible aesthetic and he couldn't stand playing against them. So I literally decided to troll him and play Ophelia. I mean, that's um, exactly the kind of player that Bayou wants, right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but I was real close to picking up Misaki and Jacob Lynch instead. So never actually got to play him in second edition. Played Bayou for the majority of the, you know, kind of the first three quarters of uh, third edition. And then I decided just to kind of say, you know what? I'm, I, I have the models I've been meaning to do, for, do it for a while. I think her rules are really solid. Let's give it a go. And then the next thing you knew, I played in like i don't know four events five events in a row soloing misaki <laughs> and hey, uh, when it clicks it clicks when it clicks it clicks that's it so about misaki and the last blossom keyword and where you th where you kind of feel that they fit within the faction and where their strengths and weaknesses lie but one of the things that I kind of wanted to preface this a little bit with is just kind of a little snippet about what the last blossom keyword really does within the lore of Malifaux and who Misaki herself is. So she literally is the boss of the 10 thunders now. I mean, basically since third edition uh, rolled in, she took over the reins of leadership from her father by killing him in true yakuza esque sort of fashion um and uh now that madness of malifaux is rolled around along with malifaux burns she's found that um the burdens of leadership are uh well they're quite a weight to bear are they not <laughs> always always 
Uh, when you start hearing uh, whispering in the dark and you start jumping at shadows and thinking that all your friends are going to betray you, um, yeah, things are probably headed down a tailspin for old Misaki, if I had to guess uh, where the rest of her story is going to go. Um, were there any kind of major lore callouts or anything that you wanted to add? I, I know that was just a very brief overview, but for anybody who's not familiar with the lore, uh, basically know that Misaki is sort of like the de facto leader of the, the Ten Thunders faction. Yeah, it was a big jump for her lore-wise, as I recall. Yeah. I mean, when her dad was in charge, I remember that she was very disrespected pretty low on the totem pole overall, and to the point where she wasn't even only Ten Thunders, right? She was an outcast as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, it was a big story change. Yeah, that's right. I actually had completely forgotten that she used to be dual keyword or dual faction. You're absolutely right. She was an outcast. Huh. I think I saw her way more an outcast in, than I did in 10 Thunders back oh, yeah. in second edition. Because yeah. The upgrades yeah. were so good for her there. But uh, yeah, absolutely. And her keyword actually still has some ties back to those outcast roots uh, in, in, I think, just one of the models that they can bring in. But we'll kind of get to that. Uh, once we start doing some of the model breakdowns. Um, yeah, definitely. I, I'm, I'm very interested to see where Misaki's lore ends up taking her. Um, I'm kind of happy to see that uh, she and Lin Lee are in the story kind of forming like a budding platonic friendship. Um, uh, maybe the uh, very positive influence of uh, Lin Lee and her sort of glass half full attitude might... Uh, ease misaki's uh stresses and said burdens of leadership a little bit everybody needs a friend yeah they're like besties yo everybody needs a friend that's right so how does last bot blossom play um well on the table it, it really i think probably the best thing to do would be to go over some of their key mechanics first so Landon, you want to share some of the kind of key front of card abilities or shared triggers or uh, anything else that sort of helps tie the keyword together? Sure. So I think you can't talk about Last Blossom without talking about Shadow Markers. There's a couple different ways they get out. The primary ways are going to be that Misaki 1 puts them out at the start of her turn, and Ototo can make them with his uh, 1 AP action that has a trigger to jump to him. There's a couple incidentals here and there, but those are the big ways that you'll see in most every list. Uh, and these markers, they're destructible, they're concealing, and most of your models can either jump to them or pop out of them. Uh, Misaki can, when she starts her turn, unbury next to them, because she'll normally bury herself. Or uh, I know the crime bosses and the uh, the Torakage, they can jump to these. So these are kind of like hubs where your models will be, you know, jumping to, jumping at, and then kind of using for a bit of defense as well along the line with the concealing traits especially on boards where there's just a lot of blocking, not so many forests. So there's a dual aspect to them, and you can also use them to summon with one of the other models, but we can get there later. But there's a lot of neat play to them, and you'll definitely need a handful of these if you're going to be playing the crew at all. (laughs) Yeah, tell me about it. I've found that uh, probably on the order of, I I think the most that I've ever really had out is probably with Misaki too, because she definitely... puts out more throughout the course of the game than uh, Masaki won. Uh, oh, they tend sure. to stay around on the table a little bit longer with her as well. But I mean, I've seen like, you know, 15 plus uh, at a time. So thankfully, they're only 30 mils, so they don't take up too much space in your bag. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. So those are super important to have if you're going to be playing Last Blossom, something to use for shadow markers. A um, couple of the other more unified keywords they have, they've got charge through on a good number of models. And this one's real simple. Just says when you charge, you get a plus to your damage flip. Um, but even if it's simple, it's not to be understated how good this is. Yeah. As uh, with just one focus, you know, you can either be pushing through straight flips on hard to wound models, or if you're, you know, hitting not hard to wound models, you can be hitting straight flips twice in yeah. two attacks, you know. Or even just you have bad cards in hand, you focus, you charge through, you're looking at a positive to damage on your, you know, reasonably spiky tracks. So it's it's just a good value keyword to just have front of card. Yeah, absolutely. And it's one that that's one of the things that <laughs> between that and the next front of card ability, which we'll talk about in just a second, that's definitely something that uh, it's easy to forget about, um, you know that's yeah. something that just kind of comes with reps but the charge through ability and the next one that we're going to talk about assassin 
if you can actually remember to use them when you do the charges or when you kill enemy models, you will find yourself in a much better position in the game, come to find out, when you actually use your your crew's rules. They tend to perform better. For um, sure, for sure. For sure. Like, no one expects the Torakage to just walk in there and slam someone for five damage on his way through. Right, right. I mean, just the, like, pretty much all of the models in the keyword that, use melee have charged through i'm pretty sure i think the only things that really don't are the thunder archers which don't have a melee attack but i'm pretty sure everything else does right even the i think that's true because the arkage have it uh the henchman has it yeah yeah i think so the only thing that doesn't is the katanaka sniper ah yes the sniper which (laughs) we'll get to the sniper um all right so the next front of card ability is assassin uh this one again pretty straightforward uh it essentially just says that if this model kills an enemy model that has not activated this turn this model gains fast so because of the way that this keyword functions and having the very spiky damage tracks like landon was just mentioning a lot of times you're going to be jockeying for that first activation uh, or even if you don't get it you're going for the second activation and if if you're going into uh, an enemy's model especially like a non-stone user usually it's just sort of like a math game as to whether or not you're going to be able to kill them uh, and then if you do kill them if you're going to be able to accomplish anything afterwards i cannot even tell you how many times you kill a model with something that has assassin and it gains fast before its activation ends and gets another AP that your comp- opponent was absolutely not banking on. Um, and it can really swing activations uh, probably more often than you might think. It's uh, it's it's one of those things that's not going to go off all the time, but if you're careful about making sure that you pay attention, um, you should, I think, realistically get at least one assassin, probably a turn. Um, I think more than that is pretty unlikely and if you're getting more than that then you're probably fighting something with like a real high model count or you're already like crushing them so it doesn't super duper matter uh, but yeah very very strong ability uh, when you remember to use it it is an excellent rule and that is the real caveat is uh, you can go games without having an assassin really work for you and then the one game that it does you'll you'll feel it uh, you know uh, the one thing that i really like assassin for is against uh, people with summoners or like these insignificant spammy totems like runaways or doves or uh, bayou gremlins like it's just worth its weight in gold there because very often you'll just walk charge and then have a third ap to just do schemey stuff with on these otherwise like you know models that wouldn't ever really be hitting assassin or you wouldn't think about it and it just turns their scheming up to 11 on already pretty decent scheming models yeah absolutely and and because of some of the kind of like teleporting or bouncing around the the board type abilities this particular ability really i find comes into play very often with a toto and we'll kind of get to that when we get to him but basically if if you're using a last blossom model that has the ability to get into position to take a swing without actually taking the charge kill a model and then gain fast and charge something else and swing on it with charge through it's um pretty pretty nasty um the other thing i was going to mention is uh it's not really a keyword ability so to speak but it's not even something that's on really all of the models or even the majority of them but i would consider critical strike to be almost like a keyword ish ability uh mostly because some of the real hard-hitting models um especially like misaki one and toto do have access to critical strike and i think that knowing when and how to leverage it and when to dump resources into it is definitely a big dividing line between like levels of play with last blossom you know when you have a master with like charge through and a stat seven attack but like a two four five damage track the difference between you saying okay I can for sure hit this. I'm holding a ram. This is the time to spend a stone for a ram, get the double crit strike, and then cheat in another severe for seven uh, to just absolutely remove a model from the board. And when not to do that is, uh, I I think, pretty important to the way that the crew plays. Would you agree, Landon? 100% I'd agree. If If you're not knowingly using the crit strike to take models off the table in one swing with Misaki, I think you're doing it wrong. That severe seven is just a 
really important and uh, good feature to unlock with Misaki. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that it's also kind of one of the secrets to success with a Toto, who I'm sure we'll get to it when we talk to him. Uh, he can be a little hit or miss um, because if your opponent knows how to deal with him, um, they can't really neutralize him, but they can usually put him down faster than you'd really like him to. And making sure that in those situations that the few swings that he does get off, he's hitting for you know six or seven damage instead of hitting min three, which is still good, but not like phenomenal, is pretty big deal. So I think that that probably covers what I would consider to be all of the real major keyword abilities or like mechanics that sort of tie it all together. Was there anything else that you wanted to add before we move on to strengths and weaknesses? The only other thing I'd probably add is that there's the unworthy of her attention trigger, which is kind of like a unique trigger to the crew that only can be called while your opponents are near shadow markers. Uh, that lets you draw a card and gain a pass token. It's kind of like the ultimate tome trigger, if you will. Uh, it's not on every model in the keyword, but there's a couple of them that have it, and it's a really powerful trigger if you can get it to work out. Um, it's one of the two uses for tomes in the keyword, I would say. Yeah, that's a very good point. And, you know, that's one I hadn't really thought about the fact that it, I think it is actually keyword specific. I don't think there's anything else outside of Last Blossom in the game that has it. And to your point, not only is it one of the only uh, tomes that you're actually going to be using routinely in the keyword, aside from like the thunderous blows on a Toto, um, which can be high value in certain situations, but getting a card and a pass token is like beyond important in this crew. Because one thing we're going to talk about in the strengths and weaknesses section is that they do tend to be a little bit resource strapped. I would say that... In terms of strengths on the table, the things that always really make the Last Blossom keyword stand out to me are some of the things that we've already mentioned. You know, when we were talking about shadow markers, Landon had mentioned that there's a couple of models that have the ability to like teleport to them. Um, mobility is a huge, huge, huge thing for this crew. Um, they really, with several of their models, have access to extremely strong movement abilities. Uh, and just Misaki herself, the 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 unbelievable amount of threat range uh, that she puts out at the start of pretty much every turn is like, I mean, really nothing that you're probably going to see elsewhere in the game. Uh, she can threaten an enormous amount of the field. And because of the way that her unbury works, if you're careful about it and don't like unbury her next to a bunch of your opponent's models, a lot of times you can, even though she's activating first, popping in and killing a model a lot of times you can actually keep her pretty much safe if you're careful about how you do the unburies and we'll talk about that a little bit more um, when we get to her model itself but the whole crew really has a lot of mobility pretty much all of the models have um, some form or fashion of movement uh, to get them into a striking position so it's really tough to like pen them in behind terrain things like piano markers that sort of thing Sure. The other things that we've already mentioned really are like the tremendous amount of hitting power that they have. Uh, we don't need to rehash the whole like charge through and crit strike discussion that we just had, but uh, this keyword slams. Um, actually, I remember one of the first times that I played against Sam um, after I kind of started playing in that uh, play group in north of Boston. We actually played a game uh, it, with pre nerf uh, Nexus versus my Misaki one and at the end of the game he he straight up said i did not respect the amount of damage that that keyword can put out um you know it, it has the ability to clear out multiple models a turn if you have the right resources to dedic to dedicate to it um if you just flip good as we say yeah if you flip good exactly and you know landon already kind of mentioned they have some very strong defensive tech but why don't you elaborate a little bit more on that if you don't mind yeah, sure. One of the good things they have going for them, we mentioned it when we were talking about Unbearing Misaki, is that we've got extended reach not only on the Master, but on the uh, Kananaka Crime Bosses. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not huge on the Kananaka Crime Bosses, <laughs> but I know you're a fan of them. Uh, but Not really. You know, okay. <laughs> I know uh, um, Andre is out of Texas. He likes them a lot more than I do. Uh, yeah, I've but, played yeah. them before and like they've, they've got some virtues, you know, they hit hard and they've got extended reach. So like there's certainly some matchups where they can get the work done. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, theoretically, like master. if you're going into like a, like a kidnap style master, I mean, 
there is a use case for playing like Misaki one and Yamaziko and a crime boss so that you've got like three extended reach auras that are kind of like shielding or your whole crew. Yeah, uh, I think that the use push into that. Yeah. The uses for that are probably kind of few and far between, but it is a thing. Yeah. So charging these guys in general, is just kind of hard, which can be really awkward for certain crews. Um, and aside from that, you can usually leverage concealment in some way. A lot of your ranged threats that you can deploy either ignore concealment or get plus flips. So you get to use the terrain a little bit better than your opponent does. So that tends to help. But as far as like damage for damage goes, they're not going to be able to absorb all that well. Um, a Toto might be the single exception, but at defense four, he has to because he gets hit every time. Right. Yeah, when when somebody swings on a Toto, it, it, it's almost not even worth flipping or looking at what your opponent flipped because uh, defense and willpower four, yeah, they're probably hitting. Like all you don't time. ask if they hit, you just ask how much. <laughs> right. What's the diff? Okay, great. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the other thing that I would mention is, uh, you know, you'd already talked about the concealment. Um, if your opponent's crew doesn't really have a way to ignore concealment, they're going to find that any ranged attack actions of any sort, even simple stuff like non-damaging things like obeys, really really lose a lot of steam um especially for those non-damaging attacks where like focusing to get through and obey feels real bad because you're not getting any like subsequent damage flip out of it absolutely um, but sometimes it's the only way you can do it because there's literally a field of shadow markers plus what other forests or other concealing terrain might be on the table um the crew also has a number of not just having extended reach but also a lot of two inch engages um Misaki and Toto are probably the prime examples of that, plus some of the other models that you'd mentioned. So just having that many two-inch engages on the table can make it very difficult for your opponent to kind of come to, come to grips with your crew. Yeah. One other thing I'd like to add, and it's not exactly a defense, but it really plays into the whole idea of how the defenses we just talked about work, is that with the, the enforcer that comes in your title box, you get a pass token. Yeah. And so, as we just talked about, you know, the two-inch reaches, the disguise, the extended reaches, a lot of these defenses lose efficacy once you're, you know, engaged by your opponent. But having that extra pass token lets you choose how the engagement on the table plays out, especially in concert with how fast the crew is, how mobile the crew is, and the ability to just reposition once you get into combat. So that, I think, adds a lot of context to how the uh, keyword defends itself yeah definitely and then one thing that i really uh one other thing that i really like about the keyword is that it's not i i it's possible i lean on thunder archers too much and i i kind of love them a super lot and we'll talk about that when we get to them um but i feel like with the thunder archers plus some of the other kind of like faction all-star out of keyword stuff that you can bring in the crew really has both a good amount of melee pressure and ranged pressure and then that in and of itself can make it a little bit tricky for an opponent to decide where and when to commit. Um, if, you know, if they're going to get into combat, but that's also going to put them in range of a, you know, potentially fast thunder archer that ignores concealment and friendly fire and has like two chi on it plus a focus, like that's kind of scary. Um, and it really might make them think twice about going into certain engagements. Yeah, I tend to agree. The um, and even if you aren't like hiring thunder archers or snipers or whatever, the nice thing about it is your opponent doesn't know that when he's declaring his list. So it has another layer to it where you have all these options both available to you in keyword and in the faction, where there's kind of a question mark as to what you're going to bring because Misaki herself is just such a strong baseline that you can really build out in a lot of different directions. Yeah, it's a very diverse keyword. I think it, it's actually one of, unless I'm mistaken, one of the larger keywords by model count in the game. Um, like it, it's, it doesn't quite have the same versatile versatility as some other ones, like a like a Hoffman or a Montucket, where there's like literally like three or four different ways that you can build a crew, and they're all effective choices. Um, she doesn't have quite that level of versatility, um, but you can really tailor make the crew. And if your opponent zigs too far when you actually zag in terms of their counterpicking, 
um, they can find themselves in a tough spot. Uh, if you if they've if they're expecting a bunch of melee beaters and then you end up taking like Monaco Ray and summoning some Katashiro and some Torakage and you run the flanks and never really engage him, just kind of dance around, um, they could really have a tough time dealing with that. For sure. Cool. So that I would say that kind of encapsulates some of the strengths of the keyword, but they definitely have some weaknesses. Um, why don't you kind of take it away with what some of your chief concerns are when you play this keyword? Well, you just hit on one of them by mentioning the Katashiro, and that's that you never really have enough cards for what you want to do. <laughs> um, and you could say that for a decent number of keywords in the game, less so probably in the current day and age, but, uh, you know... Minako Ray is an excellent hire for the crew, but if you want to summon Katashiro, you need a 10 for every Katashiro and a shadow for every Katashiro you want. So if you want to summon two Katashiro turn one, which you can do for some reason, uh, you know, that's two 10s <laughs> right there and maybe one or two stones, um, which leaves, you know, Masaki, who's looking for these straight damage flips. If you're not flipping moderate or severe on those straights, you know, then you got to be cheating those in. And mm -hmm. so there's a lot of resource allocation that has to be done. Um, you know, Arcane Reservoir glazes over that a little bit, but um, it can get tough to uh, really have enough for what you need to do. So it's important to develop those skills if you're going to want to play this crew. Yeah, you really need to be able to manage your cards very effectively, um, especially given that unless you're taking those couple of models with the unworthy of her, of her attention trigger, um, which we're going to kind of get to that when we get into the model breakdowns. Um, they might not really be optimal most of the time. There's really a very limited amount of card draw available to 10 Thunders as a faction. Um, so there's not like, a, you know, I mean, you could always take the, you know, Sensei, you, you know, good for a laugh, punch a Toto a couple of times to draw some cards. But like most of the time, that only is really going to happen probably turn one so like you can stack your hand a little bit but then after that you've got a sensei you that's kind of not really pulling his weight i think um, we've gotten better at that since we had terracotta warriors introduced as those yeah. are kind of some of the more efficient ways to just uh add to your hand at this point in time mm -hmm. so i don't i don't struggle with it as much as i once did yeah but every terracotta you're taking is probably another model that's not going to see the table like one less torakage right so you still right. gotta get your points in right and the other thing we talked about is in terms of this crew's resource pressure, not only do they need a lot of cards, but to be truly effective, they also really need a lot of stones. Um, this is one of those crews that I tend to run a larger cache with than just about any other. Uh, I have ever run into a game with like an eight stone cache and still felt like I could have used more. Uh, between stoning for cards to make sure that you're set up for good activations at the top of each turn, uh, plus frequently wanting to stone for those like double crit strikes, um, wanting to make sure that you have some masks handy so that you can do a Toto's kind of like pseudo leap. Like there's a lot of suit pressure in this keyword, um, especially if you're also, you know, going to be bringing in, you know, Minako, Minako Ray, like we were talking about. And uh, like we'd mentioned, Toto tends to get hit a lot. So he likes to use stones for prevention. Um, I yeah. would definitely agree. Uh, I think it's a little alleviated to a point if you're playing the title rather than mm -hmm. the original master. But on the original master, I feel like anything less than seven stones, I start scratching my head at like, is this quite enough? Six might be the lowest I'd be really wanting to go with uh, yeah. the first iteration. Yeah, unless there's like a super critical out of keyword hire that I or a tech pick, I should say, that I just can't figure out how to budget for otherwise. I agree. I do not like going less than six stones and seven to eight is really where I'd prefer to be most of the time. When one of the other things that you'd mentioned before when we were talking about the defenses is that, you know, the models themselves, like if the damage is getting spread around because you're presenting your opponent with a lot of targets like out on the flanks, then you can kind of stick around for a while. But if they decide that they're going to start focusing down your models, they drop pretty fast. I mean, defense four henchmen with a boatload of wounds, armor one and hard to kill is all well and good. But then when like every single model, even like piddly little Bayou gremlins are hitting him, um, he tends to get whittled down. And aside from that, there really aren't any super durable models in the keyword. Uh, pretty much everything is like eminently killable. 
uh, if your opponent knows how to target and um, use their own resources to put your models down. Absolutely agreed. Torakage, you know, they've got stealth, but once they get, you know, within that six or if they're in melee, six wounds is not the biggest ask for someone mm-hmm. to push through on just a single severe, oftentimes. Um, rarely you can see the Thunder Archer also just bite it to one attack. So yeah. like that, that can be pretty rough. Yeah, th- there's definitely a couple of those key minions that this crew tends to leverage to score their points or to help deny that are absolutely you know if your opponent puts their mind to it uh they can get one or or certainly two shot pretty much all the time so yeah tricky stuff the other thing i wouldn't i wouldn't really term it as like a significant weakness but hiring out of keyword and versatile can actually be kind of tricky in this keyword um, I, I actually ran into the same problem when I was playing Ivan because he does a lot of Shadow Marker play very similarly to Misaki. But frequently there's going to be so many Shadow Markers on the table and like it's tough for you to control where they are like two turns later. Um, a lot of times the action is just going to kind of happen in an area where there happen to be some Shadow Markers and having your own models be put at a negative to shoot through your own Shadow Markers is a real bummer like a real bummer yeah there are a couple of out of keyword picks that can get a little annoyed by it but for the most part there's a good number that just either get an eight plus flips to their actions or are more melee focused that you aren't always bothered by it but if it can definitely come to bite you if you're trying to take something like uh like a sun or a, a chiaki for like hole in the world stuff right rather weird things right yeah some of those kind of oddball ones um I mean, not that, you know, people play Lost a Super Duper a lot these days, but she's a great example of one that really gets hammered by um, uh, concealment because, like, all of her actions are going to suffer from it. She doesn't have a melee, and she's got a fairly small area of influence, so it can be kind of difficult for her to get into position and effectively use her abilities if there's also shadow markers that she has to sort of work around. Um kind of the prime yeah, I think example Maddox of that. is another like good example not that i've ever been the biggest maddox fan but if you were of the opinion that you wanted to take maddox to draw a bunch of cards like later mm-hmm. in the game once you're trying to actually do something with the bottle and you gotta start shooting with your little piddly gun like <laughs> you're not gonna like what options you have no and that's definitely one that uh you definitely don't want to have to focus to shoot that thing you just want to take pot shots and if you hit you hit <laughs> yeah yeah for sure um so i'd say that kind of that wraps up most of the strengths and weaknesses uh, this is the point where i'd like to kind of take a dive into some of the models so i guess uh let's start with the lady of the hour herself miss misaki Kadanaka, otherwise known as misaki one um do you want to go over some of her kind of key abilities and stuff that really helped define her as a model sounds good awesome so as I hinted to, or maybe outright said in the earlier portion of this uh, episode, Into Shadow is her keyword, or not keyword, but key ability, the, the big reason why Misaki is different from every other model in Malifo. And that's the ability that during the start phase, you bury Misaki and drop two shadow markers anywhere within eight of where you started. And when you activate the paired ability from Shadow, lets you unbury into base contact with any shadow marker on the board. So either the two you put out during the start phase or any shadow marker that your crew creates subsequently becomes a threat vector that you can just pop out of with your two, four, five crit strike charge through attack that's at stat seven. And it, that pretty much is a recipe for murder right there on anything but the most uh, you know tanky of minions or soulstone users. So that is in my opinion, the biggest play pattern that you'll see with Misaki and the key reason why you'll want to take her is that you're going into a matchup where you suspect whatever your opponent's playing, they're going to have a bunch of important models that aren't all that tanky that are they're going to try and score points with that you just want to like hone in on early, you know, turn one, turn two, pop out, and then just take them out in one swing before your opponent really gets to take value out of those uh hires uh she's got yeah, i mean course, she just can dominate a flank absolutely dominate it and then still get back into the action as soon as like the next turn 
exactly with other beater masters you're kind of afraid to send them out way too far because then they're there for the rest of the game and masaki just does not have that issue yeah um, and i think one really important call out with probably the the thing that makes this ability as potent as it is is the timing at which you resolve it um this is a really really important <laughs> thing and if you're playing masaki you don't want to miss time this but the way that the turn sequence actually goes is you resolve any during start phase abilities after you've already drawn hands uh, and flipped for initiative. So you know what you have in your hand and you know who's going first before you decide where Masaki is going to go um, and where those shadow markers are going to pop up. So you can really kind of play around that. And if you're intelligent with the way that you place your shadow markers, you can ensure that, well, for one thing, nobody's ever going to be able to hit her if you don't want them to, for the most part, um, because she's going to get to bury before your opponent even gets to activate a single model, and she can stay buried for basically as long as you need her to. Um, and because you already have a sense of what the order of operations is going to be, if you win initiative, it's like, okay, um, I'm going to bury her, and I'm going to drop a shadow marker over here exactly where I want it to, and then I'm going to drop a backup shadow marker over here where I think I'm probably going to need to be next turn. And then she's just going to activate right away and tear apart one of your models. Um, and then once she's done spending half the cards in my deck, uh, I'm going to use my baller bonus ability, which we will talk about in a minute. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but yeah, the timing of, of into shadow is so, so, so critically important and um, super strong. Very much agreed. And if you're using it first activation after you win initiative, it's almost like your master just gets a free eight inch leap yeah. and you get to make a shadow marker. Like it's a little nuts. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a very strong ability and the timing on it is always going to be such that you will get the best possible result of your two yeah. shadow markers. Yeah. A little, a uh, little hint to anybody playing against Masaki one, unless you're very confident in your ability to hunt her down just don't take assassinate against her because you're probably never going to score it. Um, I, in all the games that I've played with her, I think I've had her die like twice. Um, and it's usually because I misplayed something. Um, if you don't want your opponent to hit Misaki, they will probably never hit her. Yeah. I think the time that I lost Misaki was I dumped all my hand on, you know, killing something important and uh you know did the abandon honor shtick you know so you shuffle all the spheres back in your deck and then my opponent just you know went with his stitched and just outflipped the crap out of me and just <laughs> blew her up because uh extended reach doesn't matter all that much into ranged attacks nope stitch do what stitch do sometimes but i agree it's it's pretty rare uh, extended reach keeps you safe from a lot of threats in concert with your two inch reach on the actual master itself so you can kind of keep guns in check and you can kind of keep melee in check, but there's a couple weird models you got to look out for because while you have excellent defensive stats at defense six, will power seven, uh, and maybe a less excellent move five that some people might exploit, it is still possible for force hits in through those defenses once you've already blew your load on uh, you know your amazing offensive potential. Yeah, I mean she's she's got an outstanding stat line. Um... Uh, defense six willpower seven is nothing to sniff at and <laughs> that in combination with the charge through and all the other stuff mean that she can be pretty difficult to really get to grips with the other stuff that she has which is not we don't really need to go into great detail on it but a big call out is that she does have mobile warrior so uh even if for whatever reason she's not buried or if you unbury into engagement with a model you can still charge after you hit the table which actually comes up more than you might think. Um, a lot of times, you know, especially early game when you don't really have a ton of shadow markers, like turn three, typically, um, there might not be a, an ideal spot for you to unbury and still get done what you need to. Um, but if you can just unbury, even if you're engaged, you're basing something, you can just charge straight out and go after whatever your intended target is. Yeah, I find it matters a lot like turn one even where you're yep. trying yep. to go out of the shadow marker that you just placed with the toto um and at that point in time your movement is very tiny since from shadow makes your move lower so you kind of just want to go where you can get um but i think the other important ability you know she's got some some backup 
skills in like Lightning Strike or Oebun's Command that give you a plan B if you can't just charge in Bacento two or three times. But Abandoned Honor is the really <laughs> important ability we haven't talked yeah. about. <laughs> God. Um, and what that one does oh, is... Oh boy. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> it wants you to go first in the turn because it does something for every other friendly model that has not activated. So you want to do this earlier rather than later. You get to shuffle a card of your choice from your discard pile back into your fate deck. So it's a double whammy if you want to use it earlier, because if you're shuffling cards back into your deck, that only matters if you flip them. Right. Um, and then this also kind of plays into your defense a bit with its Crow Trigger, which I've stoned for before, I've cheated for before, it kind of depends, but you're also perfectly happy to miss it if you uh, really don't have the resources to uh, go for it. And that's for each Crow you shuffle back in with the basic action. You choose an enemy model with an 8, and they either have to pitch a card or gain stunned. So, doing that early enough, you know, if you flip enough crows on damage or whatever, or if you're cheating in for executes as opposed to crit strike, that can lead to a pretty big swing in either card advantage or just turning off triggers and bonus actions to the point where it kind of makes up for the fact that you've already dumped all these resources and helps you stay alive a little bit better. Yeah, and I found that, um, you know... <laughs> the last thing that your opponent wants to see is Misaki on Barry anywhere near kind of a ball of their important models and then hand out stunned at the very start of the turn. So, you know, frequently people are going to discard, you know, not not face cards most of the time unless it's a critical model, but they're going to discard some fairly high value cards, like even some like, you know, high moderates like sevens and eights if that's all they have in their hand. And it, it sounds kind of goofy, but that's actually one of the things that can sometimes help keep some low defense models in the keyword, like a Toto, a little bit safer. Uh, because a lot of times those kind of middle ground moderates are going to be enough to hit a low defense model like that pretty reliably. Um, but you're forcing them to discard them to avoid getting stun put out onto a bunch of their models. Now, granted, it's one of those abilities that like, your opponent always gets to make the decision. Um, so they're going to choose whatever is the most optimal for them. But especially at the start of the turn, that's a pretty rough decision to have to make. Yeah, and they don't always know that they need that four of tomes for armor piercing to kill a Toto, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, it, it really can't be understated the value of the cards that you can shuffle back into your deck um with abandoned honor if you go first with misaki frequently you know oftentimes you're doing it because you've cheated a high card uh, sometimes even a face card to get that first activation so that you can kill a critical model before it gets a chance to activate so you're cheating in a card for initiative um, you're probably cheating one or two pretty good cards for attacks or for damage flips plus there's all the other just miscellaneous flips that you're going to have flipping things on like negatives and sometimes double negatives for damage so most of the time when you abandon honor i find you're not shuffling anything lower than like a 10 back into your deck sometimes you're shuffling like six face cards back in and it does not say you can't shuffle in jokers so you can definitely grab the red joker from your discard pile and put it right back into your deck that's now like a third smaller than it used to be um yeah i've definitely had someone red joker me twice in the same activation with masaki and i was <laughs> mad <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah um that's probably like the highest value ability on her card and it's the thing that is really going to incent incentivize the the gameplay where you really are trying to find surgical targets that you can take out with her at the start of the turn and then your deck is just on fire for the rest of the turn for all of your other heavy heavy hitting models it really makes those charge throughs gain so much more value. Um, yeah, nasty stuff. So do I we want to talk place. about the, uh, yeah. the title at this point in time? Yeah, I lost my place. Hold on. All right, cool. Um, before we move on to the title, one thing that I would just mention, and, and you know, we'll, we'll probably talk about this a little bit more later, um, but I think that one of the kind of secrets to success with Misaki one is really knowing where and how to commit her on turn one. It's very easy for you to be like YOLO and throw her out into a bad spot and then have her get really like punched down or damaged enough that you have to be really cautious with her for the rest of the game, uh, which is not really a position that you want to be in. 
um, very frequently, depending on the, the type of crew that I'm playing into, there are turn ones where basically all she's doing is like holding her activation until as long as, you know, as long as she can popping out and maybe doing like a lightning strike or two or an oil boons command and not really swinging on anything. If your opponent hasn't given you a relatively, you know, safe target, uh, you have to be willing to have those kind of mediocre activations turn one in order to ensure that she's in a good spot for future turns. I think very often what I try to do with her turn one is I try to go late with Ototo and have Ototo just crap out a uh, shadow marker exactly where I want her to be at the end of turn one so that she can take a very mediocre like walk walk charge maybe mm -hmm. tap something gently and then put out you know the shadow markers where I need them to be for me to take a good turn activation two. turn two because exactly. you're not going to want to cheat a lot of the high value cards on that last activation turn one because mm -hmm. you're not going to have the target access you want but once yeah. you're in turn two that's when you get to you know kind of dump those good cards into this exact spot that you need them so I guess that's another point you don't really want to overcommit your cards turn one uh, if you know you can take a significantly high value uh, activation turn two. Yeah, I mean, ideally speaking, you're going to walk into turn two with at, at least like two face cards in your hand. Uh, that way you can use them then unless your opponent really like over commits and gives you a good target to swing on uh, first turn. Yeah. Cool. So that probably about wraps it up for Misaki one. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Misaki two or Misaki fractured. So I really like Misaki too, um, like a lot. The first time that I looked at her, I just didn't get it. Like it didn't click with me. I'm like, I don't understand how this is really going to work with the rest of the keyword. She doesn't put out the damage that I need her to. The rest of the keyword can do damage, but like what's she really going to do that's going to like unlock the code? And why would I play her instead of Misaki one? And then I actually put her on the table a few times and I kind of fell in love. Um, I don't think that she's my favorite Misaki, um, but they're a lot closer than I initially expected them to be. What's been your experience with this version, Landon? I almost feel the exact opposite, where I read it the first time and I went, oh, this is really good. I can see a lot of things that I like about this card and I can't wait to play it. And I'll, I'll be fair to it. I haven't given it probably enough reps to have a strong opinion on it, but... The first two times I tried it, it just didn't work out exactly the way as I was hoping it to. A lot of the weaknesses we had mentioned uh, earlier in that the keyword kind of runs out of gas, if you will. Um, we're exacerbated a little bit if you're leaning into the obey type game plan. Because needing to flip a 7 every time you want to obey gets really costly. Mm. Um, and without the ability to shuffle all those severes and high moderates back in that the first title has, you sometimes end up running out of, you know good cards in the deck but i think there's other neat things that she does um like hidden allegiances is just an amazing bonus action yeah. uh, so she's very excellent at scoring points i think in a different gg she would definitely be a very interesting master to have in your stable i don't know if i love her so much in the current gg yeah, I mean, the times that I've had the most success with her are are pretty much like in Garden Covert um, and, and using her more as like a point, like a, a way to set up points towards the end of the turn um, or to get like an extra swing out of like a big hitter like a Toto uh, and give out focus to him and, you know, in the process. The... <sighs> Before we get into like the reasons for actually taking her, I would say some of the real key differences between her and Masaki one are well, for one, she doesn't have a melee attack, which is kind of the defining thing that Masaki one does. Um, it's really her only significant source of damage dealing. Masaki fractured does not have one at all. Um, she actually just has an obey and she has ink tip dart, uh, which a couple of other models in the game have uh, granted. She has some pretty cool triggers with it. A lot of the stuff that she does is really going to come out of effective use of her front of card abilities, though. Probably one of the biggest ones, and it initially when I looked at it, I was like, I don't see why this is really going to matter that much. But the Corrupted Familiar ability, where her totem actually gets treated as a shadow marker, uh, which can't be removed by like effects that remove them. So your opponent can't just walk up and like slam and get rid of your totem. 
is really, really huge um, for setting up the turn one that you want to see with Misaki 2. Uh, and also it comes into play usually on like second or sometimes even third turn before Shang dies uh, because it gives you essentially a mobile shadow marker that you can use to turn on some of Misaki 2's abilities uh, and some of the other abilities of the keyword. Um, another big one is her spreading influence front of card ability is so strong <laughs> if again you can remember to use it and the big one the the way that this works is after a last blossom or an enemy model takes an action generated from a non-charge effect or gains fast drop a shadow marker in base contact with them no range no line of sight it could be across the table uh your opponent gains fast you know in their deployment zone and you're going to have a shadow marker there um, if you're playing against an obey master or anything that can just generate effects on themselves or on other models again you're going to put shadow markers out way 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 deep field that matters a lot because of one of the back of card abilities where if your opponent doesn't expect it they can suddenly find that they're in an extremely bad situation uh, that they did not plan for at all um, another big one for her is that she has she ignores concealment for all of her actions, which is pretty big for an obey master. That's kind of like one of the banes of that playstyle is uh, anything that causes negative flips takes so much gas out of the tank um, that it can really be difficult to play them. She just straight up ignores concealment on all of her actions, not just on her obey. Uh, and then when she targets a model within three inches of a friendly shadow marker, she can add any suit of her choice to the final duel total. So that is pretty powerful and again it, it really helps you set up a very strong turn one uh that way you can be in a position to kind of receive your opponent's uh alpha strike or just set up for a, a pretty strong top of turn two so with all that said landon did you have any other um things that you wanted to add to some of the stuff on her front of card before we move on to the back yeah um I will I will just ask, you know, after a shadow marker is placed, I mm -hmm. think most of us just take that to mean created or dropped, but you know, it is a question some people have. Um, but you know, if it's on the table, we think it's placed. I think you'd agree with that. Mm -hmm. Um and then, you know, disguise lets you play up a little bit further up the board than you normally could with a mask of its defense five eleven wounds, but you really do have to be careful with where you're putting Misaki. Uh, she's not very fast. This one does not relocate. Mm -mm. And so you have to move this model with purpose. Because if you're spending, you know, three, four walk actions during the game with this master, you are not going to have a good time. No. No, you, you have to be okay with the fact that you're probably going to have to walk at least twice in a game. And ideally, you don't want to have to walk at all. Um, yeah. Yeah. So if you have some way that you can help move her up the field, it's uh, it definitely helps out her game plan quite a bit. But I'll tell you what, there's a lot of turn ones where she is going to walk. And then sometimes that's just kind of where she stays for the rest of the game. Um, frequently, she's only going to sit and maybe, I don't know, in in the on the order of about five to ten inches outside of my deployment zone and, and get stuff done. Um, usually I find that between all of the shadow markers that she can put out, which is a super lot, uh, plus the disguised and the shielded that, um, she can put on herself with the, her front of card ability. Um, it, it's usually enough to keep her alive through like incidental stuff, but if someone comes right for her, she's in trouble. For sure. You just kind of got to use your obeys, your twisting paths and your ototos to try and keep her out of the action so to speak uh, but with the short ranges sometimes that gets tough yeah yeah so when we get into the back of card like a lot of the two of the abilities on on her are not unique and those are ink tip dart which is a, granted kind of a new ability um, but one that several other models have and then she has obey just the kind of traditional obey um, big things to call out here are that her obey is suited, so uh, she doesn't need to stone for anything to get it. Uh, the ink tip dart um, very importantly drops a shadow marker in base contact with the target, which is going to further enable other models in the keyword. And then th the real ball buster with this one is that she does have shadow pin, um, which she can build in. 
um, because your opponent's probably going to have a shadow marker within three inches of them. So the weak damage two isn't really that exciting, um, but a mod four severe six and staggered is pretty gross on a 12 inch ranged attack that ignores concealment. Um, yeah, pretty nasty. And then she does have a little bit of card like advantage with her moment of desperation trigger where the opponent has to discard a card and if it's a weak she gets the draw card i barely ever use it to be perfectly honest most of the time if i'm taking an ink tip dart attack i'm doing it because i want to hit the shadow pin um i've used moment of desperation before and it doesn't feel terrible it just doesn't feel like a master level ap if you know what i mean mm -hmm. yeah yeah i mean it definitely doesn't that said um you know taking a focused shot and hitting a severe six with staggered does feel like a master ability <laughs> uh hence the reason that i tend to err on the shadow pin um probably a lot more than the moment of desperation for sure yeah her obey uh it's just a kind of vanilla obey the big thing on this one is that basically if she gets a crow which again she can build in if the target's within three inches of a shadow marker um the target gains injured one i haven't really used that too often just because i don't generally put much stock into offensive obeys i i don't find that they're resource efficient um that said the tome trigger uh will of the oyobun gives the target focused one which is really 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 good um because the opponent the target actually gets the focus before they take the action that's generated by the obey um so you can like obey a toto to charge he gains a focus and then you can use it right away and then be at like a double positive on the damage. Um, hit a crit strike and just do things that a Toto does. Uh, pretty gross. Uh, yeah, pretty, Will of the Oyo Bone is definitely the, the more favorite of the two triggers, but oh, Will yeah. the Corrupted is a very nice incidental thing to do when you need it. You know, if you're just obeying a model to pick back up the scheme marker they just put down or you know, walk into a position that's not scoring, you're you're not upset that they get injured in the process. It also helps a little bit with the whole card disadvantage type thing that we have going on with Obey, where you have to, like, you know, spend these good cards, even if you're, you know, losing or winning the duel, just to hit those TNs, because, like, seven is not a small number to need to hit, even on a, a duel where your opponent refuses to cheat. Um, so injured can help out a little bit with that, especially with some of the uh, smaller, like, stat five attacks you have in the keyword. But yeah, for sure, focus is where it's at. Yeah, and and one big, big, big important thing is that like kind of your your primo obey target is going to be usually like a a heavy hitter melee, or actually more often than that, I I end up using this on um, thunder archers um, for reasons that we will get to in a minute. But they really benefit from focus because a lot of times they're swapping focus into chi and frequently you want to have the chi to get to the stat eight so that you can hit the differential that you want for a straight flip but if you can hedge your bets with a focus um, most of the time it means that your opponent's not even going to bother cheating uh, because they know that you're already attacking with focus and and you can take the chi to make sure that you beat them with a monstrous stat plus they have the aforementioned shadow pin so if if you during misaki's activation see that you've got a high crow that suddenly gains a ton of value because there's really not that much else in the keyword that utilizes those crows aside from the thunder archers um and now all of a sudden you're shooting with a focused attack hitting five and staggered that ignores like everything um it can be pretty daunting um given the right situation yeah for sure um so at any rate the other two kind of unique abilities that she has are going to be Twisting Paths and her bonus action, which Landon already mentioned, Hidden Allegiances. Um, these are really the things that I value the most on Masaki 2's card. The Obey's great. It helps set up a lot of stuff. She does have some good damage potential with the Ink Tip Dart. But these are the two abilities. Now, granted, you can do this with Obey as well. But these are the two abilities that you can really use to seriously displace and sometimes neutralize enemy models. Uh, and it's not really as difficult to do as you might think. Twisting Path, the base ability, basically just picks up a target, can be friendly or enemy, they just have to have concealment, and places them 
in base contact with a shadow marker within eight inches of their current position. Um, this is one of those things where because of the volume of shadow markers that you're putting out all over the table, like especially against a crew that likes to gain fast or do out of action activation or out of activation actions, you can seriously screw up your opponent's plans uh, by moving their models into extremely disadvantageous positions. If you and for turn one, which is, I think, probably the only time I've ever really done this, you can hit the tome trigger and you can basically choose one of your friendly models to bury a la Masaki one. Um, so if your opponent's not careful on turn one and they end up doing stuff that generates shadow markers near some of their squishy models, you can capitalize on that by going with Masaki two, like second to last in the activation. Um, obeying a Toto to focus. <laughs> um, and then using her trigger to give him a second focus and then using twisting paths to bury him so that when he activates, he unburies in a horrible position for your opponent with two focus on him and then freaking murders stuff because he has charged through and he's not going to get assassin that turn, but uh, he's certainly going to be putting them in a very, very bad position. Uh, and a lot of times it's enough to seriously tilt your opponent. For sure. And if you're really being cheeky, sometimes you can even just set it up with Jin. Yeah. Um, which gets a little trickier because your opponent needs to cooperate with you a little bit on that one. <laughs> but it can happen. Yeah. Yeah. And then the the last thing that we would talk about on her is the absolutely outstanding Hidden Allegiances uh, bonus action. Uh, it is not resisted. Uh, you target a non-master enemy model within three inches of a shadow marker, ignoring line of sight and range. You just get to push them and then drop one of your scheme markers in base contact, and then you get a bonus reposition trigger, which, you know, sometimes matters, but it does help her kind of get up the table. That action is gross. <laughs> yeah, so the nice good. part about that is that you... I'm pretty sure you always get repositioned. I can't think of a single situation where you don't, because you, in order to use Hidden Allegiances, you have to target a model that's within three of a Shadow mm -hmm. Marker. I think the only reason you wouldn't get repositioned if you were targeting someone within three of an enemy Shadow Marker... <laughs> Which doesn't happen very often, but yeah, you're, no. you're pretty much always going to get it. Yeah, so it, yeah. it is nice, and I think Hidden Allegiances is a very strong draw for me as to why I would ever want to declare Misaki 2, because, you know, at least in the current GG, that can sometimes just denoy, deny a strat point without your opponent having any input and that's really good oh yeah yeah she's a model that very frequently i'm not going to activate until mid to late or sometimes even end of turn um if it's like turn three or four um she can very like almost trivially easily deny positional strategies and if you can sniff out what schemes your opponent's doing, a lot of times you can deny those. I mean, there have been activations where I've literally, I mean, it doesn't happen super often, but there was one time where I denied my opponent's strategy and both of their schemes on the same turn with a late Misaki 2 activation. Yeah, and that's just what, you know, three obeys and a, a fourth, even better than an obey, will do for you. Yeah, and even if you don't have to deny schemes... If there's like a really high value target that you are going to have a difficult time dealing with, a good example of this is like Izamu. Um, I played into a, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Yan Lo crew, not that long ago, where my opponent brought an Izamu and I just didn't really have a great answer for him in that particular game. I was going to be too busy trying to kill um, Komainu and some of the other models that were going to be carrying around Ghost Balloon Yan Lo. I really didn't have the time or resources to commit to dealing with Izamu. So instead, what I did was like, all right, well, he's in range. So I'm going to ink tip dart him to give him staggered. And then I'm going to twisting paths him back to a shadow marker that's like way behind him that he set up for me on a previous turn. And then I'm going to hidden allegiances him even like three inches further back. So now he's way outside of the action. I've only actually had to put two cards into making it happen. And he's out of the game for effectively two turns. Um, it's not something that's going to happen all the time, but her ability to neutralize an enemy model through displacement is, I think, pretty important if you can kind of identify the right opportunities to do it. 
I'd absolutely agree. And um, that's definitely one of the reasons why if you're playing against Masaki 2, you might think to yourself, the shadow marker that you're leaving in your deployment might not bite you in the ass later, but it, it will can and it will. So oh, yeah. you should definitely spend the action to get rid of it if you can, or just ideally not make it to begin with. Yeah, I mean, it feels real bad to have to spend an AP to get rid of a shadow marker in your deployment zone on turn one, but I guarantee you, you need to do it. <laughs> it's a good idea. It's a real good idea. Yeah. Um, the rest of the models in the keyword, we're going to go over a little bit more quickly. Um, a lot of them have sort of common abilities. So what we'll do is just sort of call them out as we go. There might be some that we linger on a little more than others. But um, before anything else, I guess let's just talk about Shang. Um, Shang really does two things for this crew. He gives you Arcane Reservoir. And he gives you either a shadow marker that walks around for Misaki 2, or he can function essentially as a shadow marker in Misaki 1 and allow her to unbury and base contact with him by and do a little bit of damage to him. Uh, and then the other thing he does is he has a you know six inch range heal that can target buried models. And if you choose, if you do so, you can choose to unbury them in base contact with him. That's pretty much it. Yeah, channeled healing is definitely like the the best thing on his card and that's saying something because arcane reservoir is on here right um, yeah but i wouldn't i wouldn't underestimate that dinky little one two three heel flip um, yeah you know there'll be games where you fail the six and you're like well this sucks and then you'll fail the six again and you'll be like well this is obviously useless but then there's games where you know your opponent will cheat two severes to push through his min three beater hits and then you'll just heal for six back with shang and you'll be like nice activation dude yeah uh, <laughs> yeah i can't tell you how many times i've like healed a toto for anywhere between four and six and then a toto activates and juggernauts and heals for another four and i'm like all right let's do this all over again bud and it's especially obnoxious when you know we were talking about how you don't necessarily want to overcommit misaki one but if you if you can really bait your opponent into like saying all right well you've got extended reach so i gotta walk in and then I got to make it worth it. So I got to hit you and I got to like cheat these cards. And then she just buries and she might be on like four health when she buries. Right. But then Shang's just going to spend some time bringing her back up and your opponent's just going to feel like he wasted all of that time and effort. Right. Um, so it's, and the important it's really thing good. with the channeled healing obey or the channeled healing on a buried model is you don't have to unbury them next to him. You have to discard a card to do it. But if you just want to go with him early and heal Masaki twice while she's buried and then still let her do her thing for the rest of the turn, do it. Or if they're playing like Tara 2 and they buried your guys, you just get to come back out on your yeah. own terms. It's great. Very yes. good. Or if you forget tool. that your opponent's playing Tara or Tara 2 like me and start Masaki buried or start um <laughs> Jin Bakara buried and then realize after initiative is flipped that you've made a terrible mistake you have a way out yeah for sure <laughs> I've definitely done that once whoops I don't know that I've ever used Shang's claws have you ever used Shang's claws uh I don't think so uh I mean if I have it it didn't generate anything memorable it's a really miserably bad attack action like both of Shang's other actions are so bad that it's noteworthy. Um, <laughs> I've thrown the shockwave before, not to any great oh, yeah. effect, but like I've done it. Uh, yeah. Needing a six for a shockwave one damage two with no other effects on an eight inch range uh, that also happens to be a projectile, so he can't even do it if he does happen to be engaged. Not a very good action, <laughs> but that's all he's got. It tends so to be the go. action you take right before Shang dies because he's too <laughs> yeah. close. Yes. I wish he had like flaming demise or something like that. At least he could blow up in a little fireball if somebody kills him. But alas, he does not. It's safer that and way. So moving on to the henchmen, uh, we actually have a couple here. Uh, we're going to break the rest of the crew up into what I've affectionately termed on the call sheet as the good, the bad and the ugly. Um the good are going to be models that I have just decided are good and did not consult with Landon whatsoever. So he will chime in and tell me if I'm right or wrong, because he's good at that. Um, the bad are not necessarily bad. Uh, they're just models that they're definitely not all the time hires. Um, they can do work, but can be difficult to apply. And I've only got one model in the uglies, uh, which we'll get to. Uh, that's a model that I uh, have hired less than five times and has terribly disappointed me every time that i've actually put it on the table so 
Yeah. So I guess uh, let's start in the goods with the big man himself, the guy that we've talked about several times already, and that would be Ototo, who you definitely want to use the alt model for because it is a zillion times better than the one that comes in the core box. I feel like if they had just left the sculpt from second edition for the core box sculpt, I'd have to disagree with you. But just <laughs> looking at what they've got on the card, it's kind of like he's doing this weird Slav squat type thing. Yes. He bought one of the squatty bodies. He's just practicing. Yeah. Um, no, I agree 100%. You'd want the alt model on this guy. <laughs> um, yeah, Ototo is like one of those models that if you're playing Misaki, I feel like you're going to have a love-hate relationship with. Unless you're Jesse, in which case you're just going to love this guy. Oh, he's phenomenal. Never lets but me down. He's the best boy. I, I like to call it the Ototo tax because he's so good in the keyword that you're always going to take him. Um, but I, he always frustrates the hell out of me with his defense willpower four <laughs> and his only two AP unless you get a kill to the point where I, the storm is coming. His ability that makes the uh, the shadow marks is just so valuable that you never want to leave him home. Like in Misaki 2, you're getting the free slows and putting shadows out to get all the free suits. Um, Misaki 1, it's giving you more vectors to unbury with. And like his 3, 4, 5 attack is perfectly respectable that gets pretty good when you start adding charge through and his grid on top of it but man does he just catch conditions and debuffs and repositions and, and just damage like nobody's business at 4-4 armor one hard to kill yeah and with very limited ability to remove conditions um in the thunders faction uh that's probably the thing that really holds him back the most is if your opponent manages to get like a stunned or a staggered on him or god forbid a distracted oh god it's brutal it's brutal yeah. there's nothing worse than getting basically one ap out of a toto uh, because he doesn't have like flurry or really anything else aside from the assassin um and then like missing with the attack because you spent all your cards on misaki yeah it's rough yeah, if he had shrug off, I think I'd really like Ototo, but he doesn't. So uh, he I'm doesn't. I'm I'm in the like you'll always hire him camp for sure. Like he does good stuff. Thunderous blow is a pretty good trigger when it's good, and when it's not, you're still three, four, five with crit strike. Like he can hit those severe sevens like Misaki can, and if you're on plus flips, it's not even as expensive to do. Um, and if your opponent just misjudges how much it takes to kill a Toto, either because you've got stones or you stoned better than they expected or they just didn't understand that when you're at half you turn into a murder machine like, <laughs> you can go to town and just punish some terrible misplays like that um, yeah, his grit is very impactful if your opponent man if, if they just literally knock him down to five and then you're like, alright I guess the Toto's gonna activate now um it's a bad day for them. Um, I can't think of a yeah. worse feeling than just knocking Ototo to exactly five, having him go slap you twice for severes, and then just juggernaut back up to nine, and you're yeah. like, thanks. <laughs> yeah, it's brutal. He's a model that, like, I kind of uh, frequently I'll actually play him similarly to like how I play things like War Pigs and stuff in the Ulix crew, where a lot of times I'll actually hold his activation almost to like incentivize my opponent to swing on him if he's not in a super vulnerable position and i know that the damage they're going to deal to him is probably just going to just going to knock him down to grit and put a model into his engagement range um there have been many times that i've intentionally held him to wait for my opponent to deal more damage then activated kill the model charged kill the model juggernauted um yeah he can have those real superhero activations sometimes or sometimes he does literally nothing, uh, to your point. Yeah, and one of the tough things about him is that he does not have Mobile Warrior. So once no. he's engaged, he's stuck fighting whatever he's fighting unless you want to smoke bomb out. Right, right. I will say I am consistently uh, surprised at how frequently his like bonus Ruthless really makes a big difference, though. Um, yeah, especially with that willpower for it. It's pretty clutch. Usually it's to get around like manipulative, um, but yeah, it's uh, it's a nice, nice little extra little front card rule to have on there. For sure, we are the the ruthless faction, if nothing else, in Ten Thunders. Yes, we have lots. So moving right on, let's talk about Minako Ray, one of the other henchmen. 
Um, she's a model that I have actually had kind of a hot and cold relationship with sim similarly to, uh, your relationship with a Toto. Um, I have kind of come around on her though, uh, especially in this GG laugh off is just like super strong, but why don't you share your thoughts on Miss Monaco Ray and her little paper demon buddies? So I tend to be a fan of Monaco Ray. I can understand not taking her in a list if, you know, summons are bad in the strategy or whatever. But whenever you get decent value out of little paper demons, I think she's a pretty good hire pretty much always. For eight stones, even if you're not summoning with her, she offers a pretty reasonable, uh, you know, product offering at defense six with a good defensive trigger, movement six, and, you know, the two, three, five attack with charge through. Uh, the trigger, if you're not familiar, allows you to attach a upgrade to your opponent where, and they have to miss in order for this trigger to work, but at defense six, they have to be really sure they're going to hit for, you know, them to not get this upgrade. If they're just taking incidental attacks, not really thinking about it, you're going to cheat a card up. You're going to use this built-in trigger and you're going to hand them the upgrade. What the upgrade does is that, firstly, you get a built-in trigger on your melee to make all your damage irreducible if they have the upgrade. <laughs> Super and gross. then secondly, if you kill them while they have the upgrade, you just get to summon a Winudo. So while her front of card might not look amazing defensively on just eight wounds, uh, no other defensive tech other than being a henchman, the upgrade contextually makes that defense six do way more work for you than it would on another model. Yeah. And additionally, because of one of her other front of card abilities, it disincentivizes your opponent from continuing to attack her. Because after she suffers damage from an enemy model, any enemy model with that upgrade attached suffers an equal amount of damage. <laughs> it's so gnarly. Yeah. It's it's rough. Um, and now, having been on the wrong side of a red joker from Minako Ray, yeah. I can tell you, sometimes even when they, they plan to kill that model, it just doesn't work out for them. And, and you get right. hugely advantaged for them just trying. Yeah. One thing that's worth noting on her is that like, she does she does have the potential to do irreducible to that one target but it, she doesn't have like a bananas damage track she doesn't have a, any triggers that can increase her damage and even with charge through she's only got a two three five but that five is pretty spicy if you do happen to get it on a target um and you're hitting the irreducible uh and i i can definitely see spending a red joker for a big six on that oh show yeah. The uh, the other trigger she has in our melee is adversary, which is just kind of little, kind of nice, because uh, it helps alleviate card advantage a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not for certain the uh, main appeal here. The main appeal is definitely you've got move six laugh off in a model that your opponent definitely does not want to touch, uh, because she'll very quickly become the stove, uh, and yeah. it is turned on. Um, but the other thing she does, as we talked about a little bit, is summons these Katashiro which I don't know if we want to spend a lot of time on them, but they're essentially models that, you know, have a five inch place for no TN. So they're really good schemers that have way more damage than you'd expect for a model that you just incidentally summon with your already good H stone henchman. And then Minoku herself also has a quality of fate, which is just a bonus to draw cards. If your opponent has more cards than you, which very often at some point during her activation, they will. Yeah, and you know, it's it's kind of funny because you take Minako and if you draw into the right hand, it's turn one and you're like, oh, I have like two 10 pluses that I just kind of don't super need for anything. And for some unknown reason, she has a summon that can be used multiple times a turn to your previous point. You can literally be like, all right, well, I guess I'm just going to put Misaki's two shadow markers close enough to her that she can summon Katashiro off of both of them and just like not move this turn but I'm getting two free models that are super fast and can hit unreasonably hard for their um souls for their cost uh and then I'm still gonna get another shadow marker to unbury off of using a toto so like sure uh and all just of a sudden the, the math of the game up, has not? changed significantly for your opponent <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a really good upside for hiring this model to just randomly start the game with two Katashiro sometimes. It's uh, it's very strong. Yeah, and unless you're playing in like cursed objects where they're like actively kind of a bad thing, um, especially if, you're, if your opponent has any degree of mobility so they can just catch them, um, even though they can't score strat, like just having those two models with just free T10 
TNless leaps can basically score you multiple scheme points um, in the right pools. Uh, pretty big deal. At the very worst, they're plus flipping at your opponent on their one, two, four damage tracks, which mm -hmm. they're doing, you know, two to three times a turn, uh, potentially with Blade Rush, even if your opponent's doing some really wacky positioning. So they, they can do a lot of damage in one activation. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So we can move on to uh, one of my favorite models in the keyword, and I've already kind of espoused their virtues a little bit. Uh, those are the Thunder Archers. So Landon, why don't you tell me why I am wrong for hiring a Thunder Archer into every, basically every single game that I play and occasionally hiring two? So the good thing about the Thunder Archer is that he has incredible stats as far as offense is concerned on his stat six longbow that ignores concealment, ignores incorporeal, and you can use G to buff it up to stat eight. The not so great things about the Thunder Archer is that he's, you know, defense five, he's seven wounds, he has no reduction. So that means once your opponent does seven damage to him, he's absolutely dead. He has no <laughs> melee attack. And the back of his card, aside from the fact that he has this, you know, longbow that shoots people, is, is pretty barren. Um, so pretty much the only thing this model does is take shots, which is two, three, four gun. Um, and it's got some reasonable triggers. Like, if you can reliably shadow pin with this guy, he's probably worth his points. But if you're not reliably shadow pinning with this guy, I'm not certain why he's in your crew. Yeah, it's mostly just... Because they're, I I don't value using crows from Masaki's execute really very much at all. Um, I think that most of the time, unless you're just incidentally flipping it, it's not really worth cheating a crow specifically to hit. Um, so that means that the Thunder Archer is pretty much the only model that utilizes those moderate to high crows. And with their stat six going up to eight with Chi... Um, you can even take like a 10 or a 9 and pretty reliably hit. Um, the other thing that's worth noting is, you know, like like we said, they ignore um, concealment and they ignore incorporeal, which doesn't really come up super duper often, but they also ignore friendly fire. So most of the time they're actually hitting on straight. Uh, there's very little that they have to worry about. And even cover isn't like a huge deal for them because their damage track is already only two three four like getting an extra negative on that it's not the worst in the world um it's not great but it, it's not as punishing as it is as it is for some other models and because they can go to the stat eight like the plus defense isn't really as big a deal i will say that i got more mileage out of them in previous ggs when target practice was a higher value action there's not as many scheme marker schemes that people actually take in this gaining ground so it's definitely lost a little bit of value um but if that changes in a future gg i can see their value um, going back up um, yeah the last thing about them is that fistful of arrows their bonus action that essentially just adds blast to all their longbow attacks it's it's cute and when your opponent kind of forgets about it, you get insane value out of these guys. Mm -hmm. But your opponent has to cooperate with you on this one for it to be really good. And it's pretty expensive on needing a 6 with G or an 8 without mm -hmm. to actually have it go off. But it can lead to some pretty insane moments if it if it works. Yeah, the big call out on that is that they do have the aggressive chi trigger, which makes the damage from their action irreducible. It doesn't just make it irreducible to the target. <laughs> it makes it irreducible to anything that they happen to blast on as well. Um, so kind of the, the magical Christmas land scenario with these guys, which does tend to happen a lot more in Masaki 2 than Masaki 1 because she can hand out extra focus to them, is that they get a focus which a lot of times they're actually going to end up reserving for their activation. They don't really use the focus on the obey shot that Masaki has them take, or sometimes she'll actually have them um, obey or she'll obey them to concentrate and then they'll get to focus out of it, which they can bank for critical situations. And then they just end up, you know, there have been times that I've like flipped the six and spent the chi just so I can get the fistful of arrows with the extra inner piece trigger for another concentrate. And then it's like, okay, well, I'm blasting and I'm hitting severe four irreducible and then I'm hitting three irreducible on one or two other models. Um, you're welcome. 
I guess. It doesn't happen all the time, but when it does happen, man, oh man, does it feel good. Yeah, and you've got a actually pretty decent ability to group people up in Misaki too, between yeah. the ability to obey them to go charge their friends, and then the ability to subsequently hidden allegiances and other model in there. It's not terribly unreasonable that you might blast onto one or two models. Uh, but it requires a little bit of setup and a little bit of cooperation. It does. Yeah, very frequently I'm using them more to like finish off other models that I've already weakened with like Misaki or a Toto or something else. Um, yeah, occasionally they, so. they go ham and they actually kill something during their activation from full, but most of the time I'm there to let them kind of pick up the pieces uh, that my other models weren't quite able to close the deal on. Um, when I said always one, I mean like literally I hired one. I hire one in almost every one of my crews. I've honestly only taken two like two times and realistically it wasn't worth it because they are kind of expensive at seven stones and they don't really score points most of the time. Um, they're there to deny points and to finish off models. Um, but I, I do, I like having some degree of range pressure in my crew and I feel like this is a model that fits pretty well. Um, granted for like a stone more, you can take some of the faction all-star ranged models. So you know, that's a significant consideration, but, you know, we'll get to that a little bit later. That said, Thunder Archers, A plus from me, Landon, where are you going to give him for a grade or a tier, tier him for me? You know, uh, if I were to go with our traditional danger planet, always, never, sometimes, I would put it in sometimes, uh, maybe towards like the back of sometimes, just because my personal preference is to take something else. That's um, fair. Because like when I'm playing Misaki, I like to have... <laughs> my you know front-loaded master and then ototo minako kind of be like this is where my killing points are and then i like to focus the rest of it just on kind of like my scheming points rather mm -hmm. than taking another thunder archer to kind of shore up what i already do yeah um i get it but like it can fit yeah i think the thing that i like probably the i, I don't know about the most but one of the real big uh strengths of this model for me is that if you have a crap hand because you've already used most of their resources, they're pretty easy to actually have like do something, even if you don't have the cards to support them. Like you can pretty comfortably just kind of top, you know, flip off the top and be like, well, I've got Chi. Stat eight's pretty good. Eh, it's pretty good odds I'm actually going to hit for something. Um, whether it's exactly what you need is another story, but I'd say they're pretty reliable and that they're resource light, which I really appreciate in this crew. Yeah, that part is definitely very important because the nice thing about Chi is that if it doesn't do anything for you, you don't have to spend it, so you just kind of get to keep banking it. Right. Uh, and if it does do something for you, you almost always are cheating second, so you're never going card negative with these models. Yeah. The other thing that's nice about them, too, is that a lot of times, because your opponent knows you have Chi and you can get to stat 8, sometimes they just like won't cheat when realistically they should. And that'll allow you to do real dumb stuff like cheat in like a four of crows and then use a cheat just so you can hit the shadow pin trigger on something, um, which is a great way to use some of those really low cards. For sure. Yeah. So enough about Thunder Archers. Uh, we'll talk about Jin Bakara, who is amazing. And we've talked about in a thousand other uh, podcasts and uh, you guys have talked about a number of times. Um, we probably don't need to go into great detail on him because everybody knows what he does. Um, the big thing with Jin that I feel like makes him a, an always higher in both versions of Misaki is his, basically his ink tip dart um, and his ability to deploy ahead. He, when he got added to the Misaki crew, I was already like, like way in the weeds of playing them. And when I saw that I could start using him to even potentially just like walk and shoot turn one if I chose not to bury him or unbury turn two and then put a shadow marker in my opponent's backfield. That way Misaki would have a tremendous additional threat vector. Um, my eyes lit up like Christmas trees. It was amazing. Um, he's awesome already, and he's especially awesome in this crew. Do you have anything else that you would like to add, Mr. Landon? Pass token good. Yeah. But one of the things that's really important about him in Misaki more so than I think it was in Ivan, not that Ivan can't get good value from it as well, is that 
Skulker, you know, the ability that gets you a pass token works while you're in concealment, not mm-hmm. just while you're buried. So I think Misaki makes Shadow Markers a little bit better than Ivan, in my opinion, as far as allowing you to place them in relevant positions for yourself. Uh, I think, Ivan, you really want to use them a bit more offensively than you necessarily need to in Misaki. Yeah. So it's a bit harder, or even just out of keyword in Explorers, where you'll see him reasonably frequently. He kind of just has to stay buried or in exactly one spot in the map. So you get to leverage his other abilities much better in Misaki, I think, than you do in the yeah, rest absolutely. of the game. Yep. So, yeah. Like you said, Incamp Tart is an excellent action for either version of Misaki that just gives you additional threat vectors or just, you know, more bad stuff for your opponent with Misaki 2. Uh, and you'll still probably keep him buried in a good number of matches to start the game just because Undercover is such an amazing action for denial. But yeah, Inktip Dart can definitely catch your opponent off. Uh, with that 12-inch range, turn one to either pop out an Ototo or a uh, <laughs> Misaki that they were not expecting when they were unpacking. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and one important note with running Jin, uh, always make sure that your opponent actually has a decent unbury target. Granted, you have a get-out-of-jail-free card with Misaki that you don't have with Ivan, uh, and that's that you can use Shang to uh, unbury him using his heal. Um, but if you happen to undercover, if you happen to bury him at the start of the game, not realizing that your opponent actually didn't take any minions for you to undercover into, um, yeah, well, let's just say I've done that before. We'll leave it at that. I think we got a fact recently that allowed you to unbury. Oh yeah. Yeah. You can always undercover. undercover. your deployment zone, but that's not, um, yeah, that's there was not some an ideal debate on that before be. the fact. <laughs> yeah, Exactly. <laughs> um so moving on to another one of my very favorite models and that's the torakage it's a model that i almost never leave home without um i love them uh stealth is great Uh, it's a good thing they have it because they only have six wounds to your point before if they didn't have stealth i would never take them because they would just get shot off the table turn one um they can disengage with agile they have all the same stuff we've talked about like assassin and charge through Their weapon is respectable. They have a no witnesses trigger that they will like never be able to take on their melee attack because no witnesses is a terrible trigger. Um, But they do also have it on their shuriken, which is slightly more usable. Um, Still at only an eight inch range. Not great. Um, Their big thing really is that their movement freaking seven. uh, And they have a ninja vanish, which does require a seven of any suit. uh, And it's a pseudo leap which lets them place into base contact with a scheme or shadow marker and then put another scheme or shadow marker. You get to choose which type into base contact with the removed marker. Um, They score points and they score points incredibly well. Um, And I believe if you really, really super needed to, you can even use one of the faction upgrades to give them unimpeded and a unimpeded move seven model that can blink around is very very annoying to deal with yeah no i agree i don't think i would leave i would i don't think if i'm playing misaki i would put i would not hire one of these i would i think i would always take at least one and maybe that's just the pools that i tend to like take misaki in because there's definitely pools where these guys might not necessarily be useful or the best hire Mm -hmm. but i just don't think i'd play misaki in those pools because these guys are just so fast yeah and they're almost like our faction Sillerid, so to speak. Yeah. Like Sillerids don't go into every game, but every game that you're taking a master that can hire Sillerids in, you hire Sillerids. Yeah, for sure. The couple of call outs on them are that you can definitely play yourself into a corner because their Ninja Vanish has such a high stat requirement. You need to hit a seven to use it. Um, that's not nothing. Uh, that's a pretty significant card. The other thing is that you have to have a model to actually place in base contact with. So it does require that you're a, you have a little forethought in terms of where you're putting shadow markers. You're, you're very rarely going to have, you know, friendly scheme markers upfield for them to, to jump to. It can happen, but more often than not, it's going to be shadows. Uh, and usually what ends up happening with them is like you're doing like a spread them out. And you like, you know, run them off to the side of the table, ninja vanish to a shadow marker that you put down there for reasons. 
um your opponent can't get to him and you've just put another scheme marker down without spending an extra ap which is just great the reason i tend to find i have scheme markers out is for your unpack turn one you can very often just like instead of walk focus walk and drop a scheme marker mm-hmm. and then your torakage can just start with the ninja vanish and then walk yeah. and drop another scheme marker mm-hmm. and then your second torakage can then just walk <laughs> ninja vanish to the new scheme marker and then you're really gaming yes um, if you do the two torakage leapfrog game uh it's good times good times yeah and for that reason i tend to like taking two torakage whenever i take torakage which is probably why i never have room for thunder archer but probably yeah yeah exactly and like yeah <laughs> when we've that actually wraps up the uh the models that i have in the good category are there any others um from the other categories that you would nominate to be added to this section i think that is what i would call the cutoff for the good as well uh in our qu- categories the good the bad and the ugly um this is definitely the good yeah uh, the sure. models that i think you'll always be in consideration for in your generic i am playing a game of malifaux game mm-hmm. cool so we move into the bad which are not again necessarily bad but certainly not always picks uh, first one is going to be yamaziko um, she is a model that, quite frankly, I have always had a difficult time using. Have you had much success with her, Landon? So I know there are corners of the internet that absolutely love Yamaziko for like these weird gun line lists that I just would never lead with Misaki <laughs> and thus would never hire Yamaziko for. Um, but, you know, if gun to your head, I have to play Misaki and I want to play a gun line list, maybe you'll put Yamaziko in that. Um and I think she's got some interesting tech that I'd want to try out in Misaki 2. Having unworthy of her attention built in on a trigger can't be that bad. Problem being your stat 5, so... Mm-hmm. Eh, but Great Teacher is actually an amazing... Her bonus action, it requires you to discard a card, but it gives all your minions plus to all duels, and that's why people like her for gun lines. But I actually find it's a very reasonable piece of defensive tech that especially helps out with your... Uh, offensive heavy cheat strategy where you can very often force your opponent to cheat cards on defense even though usually the attacker cheats second on defense given how the stats work out so it's a pretty good action i've used it to some effect out of keyword i've never really tried it in misaki though if i'm being honest yeah i mean there's always that kind of goofy thought of doing like i'm gonna do two thunder archers or three thunder archers and you know a couple of like a katanaka sniper and i'm just gonna shoot the crap out of my opponent um but that's not really that good because i take thunder archers because you can kind of like surgically apply their attacks but if you're shooting with like a whole boatload of two three fours it's not necessarily gonna make a big splash um it's okay I will say that they do, you know, she does combo up with another one of the models on this in this kind of tier, so to speak, which is the Katanaka Crime Boss to kind of help plug some of the holes in their kit, I, I feel. Um, but I, again, I think she's kind of tough to use. Another thing that's kind of weird about her is that she technically has like three bonus actions uh, and they're yeah. all pretty good in the right situations. Um especially with move four, you're going to want to use nimble like kind of often, um, at least for turn one, um, which means that you can't use great teacher, which is not great. Um, Finesse is kind of situational, you know, whatever. I will say like the two or three times that I've played her, I did get like that magical activation where I went with her early in like turn two before, and my opponent had like dove in with Nekama and did like a double master tactician and made her discard four random cards. Um, I still lost that game. (laughs) So it didn't really have that much of an impact come to find out, but it sure did feel fun. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I struggle to call this model bad because I really like a lot of the different things that it does. I just never find that it comes together for me. Yeah. I think the things that really hold it back for me are, the move four and the stat five uh melee attack that has a two three four track um i know that's not really what you're taking her for but 
I find that she just often doesn't make the cut, especially when there's so many other six, seven, and eight stone models that are in keyword that are so good. I think if you even threw like a stat five ink tip dart on this model, that I would like to take this model a lot more. Yeah, if it had a ranged attack, that would be a totally different story for sure. Um, yeah, that'd be good. I don't know. Maybe she could take, uh, what's that upgrade? What the heck is the upgrade called that gives her the um, the kunai? Yeah, the one where you have to train charge ninja? to get it. That that's it? the train ninja. Yeah, it gives you unimpeded. Um, yeah, I mean, that's probably not terrible, but then you're spending like nine stones for this model, I don't think which I'd is pay like nine not. Stones for that. <laughs> that's not good. That's not. You good. also only get to take that on the charge. So you don't even. Oh, you can only take it on once. the charge? Correct. Oh, that's terrible. Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Moving on. Katanaka Crime Boss, the model that me and Andre disagree on. And I don't know where you stand. So why don't you why don't you open it up? All right. So, you know, just looking at the stats, five, six, four on defense whip move. You could do worse, but like movement four is not exciting to start opening up on a model, especially in a keyword we've, you know, extouted the virtue of it being a very mobile keyword. Seeing another move four is just kind of disappointing. Protection money, um, you know, we could write a novel on what why this is either broken or useless. Um, but if we're gonna if we're gonna ignore the fact that Koji exists right now in his current form, we're gonna go with it's useless. It's and pretty just useless. Leave it at that. Yeah. Um, extended reach. There's a lot of models with extended reach. Sometimes you'll find this is useful tech. Sometimes you'll find this is just kind of like disguised. Um, it's okay. But as far as like being tanky models that want to be in the thick of things. They're eight wounds and they have no reductions, which is to say they have no armor, they have no yeah. soul stones, they have no shielded or anything like that. They don't even have hard to wound. At least give them hard to wound, <laughs> like something. <laughs> so, like, these guys will take a couple of hits and they'll beef it because Shang's one, two, three healing is not for them and it will not keep them alive. No, no. And, like, um, they, they're, you know, their melee attack is pretty solid. Three, four, five is great. Heave is a fantastic trigger. They do have that unworthy of her attention trigger. Um, Their bonus action is like legit, very, very, very good. Um, But pressure is horrible. It's such a bad action. I don't think (laughs) I've ever gotten it to work on any model it's printed on. (laughs) It's so bad. And it's only step five. (laughs) We talked about the browbeat effect on Misaki, but like this is way worse than that because like, firstly, you have to win a duel with it at stat five that if i am not mistaken does not even ignore concealment by the nope, way does not and requires them to be near a concealing marker to work right that's <laughs> terrible technically they can be near a scheme marker too but let's be real it's going to be a shadow marker <laughs> like maybe um, if they could do it on friendlies so they could get like kind of a cheeky like obey maybe but it's enemy only and yeah ugh, yeah it's not good like I could, I could write a novel on why I do not like this action, oh, um, but I think we can probably just leave it at it's very bad. <laughs> yeah, the worst uh, thing yeah. is like this action has existed since third edition came out, and it's been terrible ever since. And then they put it on another model, meaning Corvus Rook, in a keyword that also generates shadow markers, and it doesn't ignore concealment there either. Like we did the same thing over again, guys. Like what? <laughs> We didn't learn. Look, it's what okay happens. because he makes scheme markers that he can use for it in either of his keywords. So sure. you, know, you just get rid of the shadow markers and you use the scheme. I, I don't know. Sure. I really don't know. Sure. Um, um, yeah. But, anyway, it's but the thing that makes these guys worth playing potentially is Thunder's Territory, yeah. where they kind of have like this significantly cheaper leap that the Torakage have that you only need a 4 for because you can jump to friendly schemes or friendly shadows. Um, and the nice part about it is that you also then get to push enemy models away from it. Um, that way you can uh, still get your charges off or keep things in your two inch range instead of, uh, you know, having to awkwardly place yourself inside theirs. Um, and the fact that these guys are two inch reach also helps keep them alive a little bit until your opponent's also playing two inch reach models. Uh, then you're just dead. Right. Um, or like every time that I've played them, they're like, Oh, he just has concealment. Okay, I'm just going to focus shoot him. And I'm like, oh, great. He has stat five. Uh, how much? Six? Oh, great. Okay, now he's at two. Yeah. Awesome. And then he's dead. And then he's um, dead. 
Yeah, the last the last game I saw these guys played in, they played against Mysterious Emissary, and then their move four <laughs> was just very, very bad in that yeah. matchup. Oh man. Um so these guys have a lot of weaknesses. They've got some very narrow strengths, I would say. Yeah. Like in the matchups where their massive weaknesses don't come to play, there's some payout. Yeah. There's some payout. But the problem with their payout is that it's generally payout that you already get in Misaki one with just like your regular suite of models. Right. Like you could take him for laugh off or you could take Monaco for laugh off, who's the same cost and universe is better. Um, yeah. You've already got extended reach and multiple other models. Protection money is borderline useless. Um, and then all of their best stuff on the back of their card really comes from triggers because all of their triggers on their melee attack and thunders territory are phenomenal but they don't have a way to build in the suits and you already have enough card pressure that you don't necessarily need to worry about another suit hungry model hitting the table. And um, they're all Ram suits, which, you know, crit strike on a Toto and, uh, you know, Misaki, we right. talked about how good that is. Exactly. Or I could take um, Eve. Great. Yeah. yeah. But I think these guys really would shine in those matchups where their weaknesses aren't as bad. And you're playing Misaki too. Yeah. Yeah, I've so played them you... in Misaki too. Like I, that's pretty much the only time that I've used them, and they have they've done enough work that I wouldn't say no to doing it again in the right matchups. But uh, they're just so damn easy to kill. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, I think we've conditionally placed expectations on these guys, but there's a reason they're in the bad category, gentlemen. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Um, so now we'll move on to the Woku Raiders, the bad model that I take all the flipping time and 50% of the time I say to myself, I'm not taking the stupid model anymore. And then I still do it every time. Um, that sounds really familiar. Yeah. Yeah. So what's your relationship with Woku Raiders, Landon? So the last game I played uh, with a Woku Raider was actually at Captain Con. I was playing for the Scorpio, <laughs> so I was doing stretching my Thunder's muscles. And uh, I thought to myself, all right, there's catch and release in this pool. Woku Raider's a hard model to hit. It's got bulletproof, so even if they shoot it, I can heal it back up with Shang. I'll take the hard-to-kill upgrade on it. It's hard to kill, eight wounds, bulletproof. That's a pretty tough model to shoot through, right? Uh, and then turn to my opponent, you know, shoots it with Fuhatsu and just takes it off the board and i'm like well uh, that sucked that was 10 points gone uh even even through the upgrade because i think he hit like uh he hit it incidentally for like one on the first turn and then crit strike it again <laughs> of course. And yeah just blew through it and i'm like every time this happens but you know i could have cheated cards of trying to save it but by the same point in time it, it was just kind of like bait because then i had the red and then 13 rams and something else and i think i took two models off the the table in one Misaki activation. So I, I got back and that's that's the most notable thing I can think of a Woka Raider ever doing for me was uh you know sitting there and getting shot turn one uh <laughs> or turn two by my opponent uh to deny me two points because I was foolish enough to take a scheme on it. Um but you know it there's a cool moment right after where Misaki did something. Yeah. Um <laughs> I will say I I have taken these quite a lot. My experience with them has been generally positive. Um, that said, like, I feel like I take a model with combat finesse because I'm like, this model's never going to get hit. My opponent's not going to be able to cheat. It's going to be awesome. And then they're like a magnet for my opponent, just like incidentally flipping 12s and 13s. And I'm like, well, I guess you hit me anyway, because that's how combat finesse works. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure combat finesse just actually rigs your opponent's deck with the good cards. Yeah, but part of that, you know, effect we joke about it, but you use your own good cards in other places, and combat finesse doesn't actually make you any more likely to win the flip. As much as we like to think it means your models don't get hit, it just means that you have the opportunity to make them not get hit if you right. save your cards for it. Um, right, exactly. Um, and then if you don't take the silent protector upgrade to give them a bonus action that's actually worth a shit um then they turn into a model that granted does have very easy access to fast uh, because of life of crime so they're pretty much always going to get three ap um but they also don't have a relevant bonus um yeah. challenge on them is in theory good um but we've already talked about the fact that you're often using your resources for other models and they're only stat five. I mean, it's a plus flip. That's like a bandit thing. Um, 
they they have done a tremendous amount of work for me and i've had some games where they've really like gone off the chain and, and just crushed it i mean they have great triggers two four five damage track charge through crit strike coordinated attack a terrible gun that you'll never use um i've used that gun you've used that gun <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, you'd be surprised, you know, stat five defense, 12 inch gun doesn't sound great. But when you're sitting there for guard the stash and you're fast, you're like, fucking, I'm just going to shoot three times and see what happens. Sometimes something does. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, um, you know, they, they've they got they don't really have the ability to displace enemy models to, to get them away from points. But if you need them to kind of like stick around a point, they're pretty good at it between like just being able to just casually get fast get drop its and then you make your opponent drop scheme markers and you get free pushes like there's value there i just don't know that it's it's certainly not eight stones of value because i feel like if you take them without the hard to kill upgrade they're just like an utter an utter and complete waste of points if you do go up to the upgrade then you're talking 10 are they worth 10 probably not I the probably games where they bring flip coordinated attack with ototo you know those games they're worth the 10 points but right. you know you're but that's the trick is like that. usually a Toto doesn't need a super lot of backup and I need them to kind of like run a flank and then they lose some gas because they don't have a good coordinated attack buddy. And yeah, I don't know. I'll probably keep trying them even though I'm telling myself that I won't. Um, but yeah. Yeah. This uh, this model wins the award for most likely to be one shot when you totally didn't think it would be. Mm -hmm. uh you know eight wounds it seems like it's out of range for a lot of models to not kill it in one hit but like yeah I'll most of the time when it. i lose it i lose it in a single activation <laughs> yeah it it's rough <laughs> yeah and that that wraps it up for the bads and we're gonna get down to the ugly um this is the only model that i have told myself i am probably never gonna hire again uh after giving it what i consider to be a fair shake and that's the katanaka sniper um is it as bad as i think it is landon so i have good memories of this model and by that i mean i don't think it, you're at all being unfair to him but one of the games i tried misaki 2 out i took one of these guys for like turf war or whatever and the thing that i like about these guys is they've got quick retreat so you can uh you know get some cheeky tn list like extra free movement with them by you know sending them up the board buried with misaki you know last or second to last activation you unbury you're either already engaged with the guy or you get charged to get engaged with the guy with your dinky sword you don't even care if you hit because you're just there so that you can quick retreat bonus out and then get your interact done um <laughs> and you're thinking to yourself but i said it was a katanaka sniper shouldn't it be shooting things that no no the answer is no it for seven points this guy is not worth his gun no no, not absolutely not. I mean, it, it's so funny because, you know, obviously Rami from Bayou needed an adjustment because he was way too effing good for six points. But when I looked at when 3E launched, I looked at Rami because I had the card. And I'm like, wow, this guy does a lot for six points. And then I look at the Katanaka Sniper and I'm like, this model is better in every or is worse in every measurable way. And it costs more. I don't understand what happened here. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's because Rami was an enforcer and it was a gremlin, so it was allowed to be good, right? Um, allowed to be yeah, good. No, these are That's these guys are definitely the worst sniper in the game. Oh, uh, yeah. I think in Misaki 2, they do gain some extra contextual value from what I said in that one of the big problems with From the Shadows is that a lot of the times you deploy up the board and then you're in a bad position and then you die after your opponent catches up. But with the mm -hmm. ability to redeploy if you you know are just in concealment with Misaki's Twisting Shadows, you can use that to kind of just like bring your opponents to bad spots on the board and then reposition. So like, mm -hmm. I think they gain a lot of extra interesting use there that they just don't have in the original. Like you'll never hire no. these guys in the original version. And no. if you do, no. there must be a very, very important totem that you really do not like uh, yeah. that you have taken these guys specifically to kill and then trade for on turn one, because mm -hmm. that is the, next best thing that they do is you know yeah. trade their lives for a totem yeah i mean the one thing i will say in their defense is in misaki 2 i can see more of a reason to use them because 
Masaki too has the ability to give them the out of activation focus that they don't have access to in Misaki one. Um, and they can kind of fill a similar role to like bushwhackers out of Bayou, um, which are a phenomenal model. And you're like, well, why are they so much better? They have the same gun. It's still a two, three, five track. They both have crit strike. Like what makes the bushwhackers better? The biggest pit reason traps. that the bushwhackers are better is because pit traps exist and you have a focus pulse focus pulse from ma to give them the focus before they mm -hmm. activate so a lot of times with the from the shadows on them and i have seen i have done it with these guys too you don't really deploy that far basically you just deploy a little bit outside of your deployment zone um essentially faking your opponent out into thinking that you're gonna you know pin them down with like you know shooting from like the top, top of like a clock tower or from like inside a piece of terrain that's close to them so, you know, Misaki 2 basically just does exactly what I said before, obeys them to give them a double focus, and then they get a either a focused sniper shot on turn one, or they are already slightly outside of the deployment zone, so they just end up walking, taking a focus shot, cheating in the ram for the crit, cheating in the severe damage to kill a model, and then they get assassin for fast. Like, there's a use case there for it, um, and I can't... in good conscience say that they're just an overtly awful model um but seven stones is too much and i don't think that that trick is something that the keyword really needs i'm better off just taking other models for the same or in some cases lower cost i can say they're overtly awful like okay. unless you're playing misaki 2 and doing specifically some of the stuff we talked about like you pay one point more you get fuhatsu like right. look at this yeah, model I mean, look at fuhatsu right. and then just like tell me you wouldn't pay one point more <laughs> yeah exactly so that wraps it up for keyword we don't need to go into the tremendous amount of detail on out of keyword and versatiles because we all know that thunders has a, a lot of great models like your fuhatsus and your lone swordsmans and what have you the two models that i was going to call out as being really potentially very valuable out of keywords um are going to be the shadow effigy i actually get a lot of work out of that guy in both versions of this keyword um Mostly because he does have the Storm of Shadows from Misaki 2, so you can put out a concealment bubble um, to help build in the suits on her obey within like kind of a larger area, especially like, uh, you know, turn two if your models kind of get away from some of the shadow markers you put near your deployment. Um, it also can help set up Ninja Vanishes uh, with its Remember the Mission, which is just a great ability. Um, so I use them. I use that pretty often. Have you ever taken the effigy? Do you like it? I don't. I feel like I might have hired this once since the beginning of the edition, but it is not a model that has been really favored for me, which is like wild because I used to play this all the time in second edition. Mm -hmm. um, but like, it's it's an all right ball of points. But I'd usually rather just have the four stones for like yeah. stones because as we as we mentioned, this is a very stone heavy keyword. Mm -hmm. And at four points, usually if I'm not taking four more stones, I'm taking a Terracotta Warrior. Yeah. Um, the other stuff I was going to mention was the Terracotta Warrior, which we've already said is, you know, just a, a good general purpose model. And it gives you a little bit of card draw later in the turn after you've already shuffled a bunch of Severs back into your deck with Misaki 1. Um, the other one is the Kunoichi. Like, it's already a great model. Um the big the bonus for the kunoichi is that their shuriken does ignore concealment which is really nice because there's going to be a lot of it on the table uh and it can kind of help to you know move them up after they've done their their normal crap first turn otodo is also a pretty good target to shoot with shuriken to galvanize and give out focus um just because he does have the armor and he has the juggernaut so a lot of times turn one like he's not doing anything else aside from getting in position and then discarding a card for juggernaut to heal back up um they're just a good model like they're i mean everybody knows that they're fantastic and i think that they do have a place here yeah they're an okay model that i like to take in kg lists i think personally in the context where i'm usually playing misaki one i don't usually want one just because i'm usually hiring with those extra leftover points the uh torakage just mm -hmm. to score whatever pool that i've decided i want to play misaki in if i wanted to play misaki in every pool every day I'd probably consider them for my uh, my box, just because they're very good models in KG pools. Mm -hmm. Like I've got your box back is excellent for keeping your guys out of engagement when you you know want to be able to dictate the fight. And free focus is always good if you can uh, you know get that set up. But you don't 
draw a, or see a ton of different cards to be able to guarantee that you'll have a galvanize to go off. Yeah. And when you're not using them for galvanize and you're not really like flipping a lot of cards to see extra for tools on the first turn, yeah. then they lose a lot of their value for your unpack. And they're like decent models for the mid game. Probably the models I've used no witnesses the most out of every model in the game on. Yeah. Just because they'll live to like turn three, four, five, where your opponent might have a couple of models left on the table and you'll feasibly have, you know, no enemy models within 12 because they're all dead. <laughs> Mine was Rami until they adjusted him. And please don't put no witnesses on any sniper models ever again. Weird. Thank you very much. That was super busted. Yeah, it was uh, it was annoying to say the least. Yeah. Uh, definitely lost in a Zamu or two that way. Oh, yeah. But um, yeah, I don't know if they fit in my usual niche for the keyword, but I could see owning them. Cool. Um, all right. Were there any other models of note that you wanted to mention? Uh, let's see now. We talked about Fuhatsu, but honestly, I don't really like Fuhatsu for many of the reasons. I don't like Kanoichi in the keyword. Yeah. Uh, it's just not what I usually am looking to do when I take this keyword. Um, I'll, I'll shout out Bill just cause Bill is my favorite 10 thunders all-star. Yeah. Um, he's very good for denying points and just being a good boy with a three or min three beat stick. I'm trying to think if there's anything really spicy I play in Misaki and the answer is no. I usually tend mm -hmm. to stick very keyword with her whenever I play. Yeah, me too. I mean, like I say that Kunoichi are good. The number of times I've actually hired him is probably like five or less, um, I even very rarely even go outside a keyword. Like, I don't think that this is a good place for the lone swordsman most of the time because he draws resources and you kind of already have enough melee beaters. Like, I don't really think you need what he brings to the table. Yeah, um, is kind of just like lone swordsman's dad. Yeah. That, you know, she does yeah, everything, but she's just bigger. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I really tend to stick to keyword the vast majority of the time with these guys as well with the exception of the shadow effigy which like i said i do hire fairly routinely especially with misaki too but yeah that seems pretty cute with misaki too it i'll is. have to try it, that it if works I play out. her again and she doesn't need as many stones as misaki one does uh because she herself doesn't really need like any um so the only thing you're really using them on is stoning for cards and using for a toto that's pretty much it so yeah. you can get away with running like five um, the only thing I would say that you could probably try that we haven't mentioned is for a lot of the more card hungry keywords in 10 Thunders, I actually really like Kenshiro. Mm -hmm. And it maybe works a little bit better for like my McCabe 2s of the world or places where you have no the warrior. Sure. But um, just tactics tokens are a really good way to ease over and smooth some of those TNs that you might have where it's like, I need to flip a seven, but I don't really need this obey to work. But it'd be really nice if it did. So you just kind of throw a tactics <laughs> token at it and you get a redo. And if it works, it works. And you're like, great. I basically just, you know, got a free a free action I wasn't supposed to get. And if it doesn't, well, then, you know, you aren't using your tactics tokens for the duels that need to work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, I can see like I can see that. I've been meaning to actually pick up um, that box so I could get Kenshiro to use uh, as an out of keyword and i yeah i can i can see doing that in the future so all the more reason for me to finally grab that one yeah the other thing that's nice about him is that reverse momentum his attack you oh, get to okay. use on your own guys if you really want <laughs> yeah. to just move them up the board a little bit extra and like you said with ototo you don't necessarily mind putting a little bit of damage onto him early so if you're just giving ototo a free six inches up the board that's not the worst turn one you could do especially for this model that you've just taken to you know essentially draw two cards a turn yeah, I mean, I can definitely see basically swinging on a Toto because like, you know, being just a little bit ahead of him, moving him up and then charging through him because you're incorporeal, swinging again and moving him again, um, yep. because that's kind of all you really need Kenshiro to do turn one. So, yep. yeah. And at that point in time, you know, you've gotten, you know, Misaki one an, essentially six inches further up the board as well. Yeah. Because the Toto's going to drop that channel marker for you. Yeah, and that, so. si that six inches, I'll tell you what, on turn one that extra six inches is it, it may as well be like 12 inches it's it's a huge amount more threat um than um uh, just a toto bouncing up and dropping a shadow marker like you normally would yeah so that's my spicy take cool i like that i like that a lot i'm gonna i'm gonna have to take that one for myself all right so you play a lot of thunders i play some thunders basically in thunders i play you know misaki Mei Feng, pretty much just Mei Feng 2. Um, Asami occasionally, 
and like a little bit of McCabe I've dabbled with, but that's pretty much it. Uh, oh, and, and a little bit of Yoko as well. So with that said, you know, Masaki's the, mo- the master that I've really focused the most time on, and I'm she's the one I'm most comfortable with. For somebody like you who's been playing Thunders a little bit longer and has a little bit more diverse experience with the faction, when, like, if you're going to a tournament, does Masaki come in your bag if you're not going for Scorpius? Let's do that. So if I'm not going for Scorpius, to be completely honest, she probably does not make my uh, my typical three masters that sure. I'll bring for an event. Um, and that's not because she's not bad. It's because she, her niche is maybe a little too niche for me, or it's covered by other masters in the faction that I'd already rather play. Mm-hmm. Um, and that she has some notable weaknesses, in my opinion, when you start running into... Lots of hard to wound, lots of armor, lots of yeah. armor and hard to wound, lots of armor and shielded, or just like the typical, like what I'll call tanky models of the current meta. I think she struggles a little bit into. And, you know, the reason why her keyword is good is because you are both fast and killy. If your opponent can make you either not fast or not killy, I don't think you have your competitive advantage anymore while playing yeah. this keyword kind of the nightmare scenario even going all the way back to like 3e launch was you declare last blossom and your opponent declares augmented and this keyword cannot deal with freaking hoffman like they literally walk all over them they can almost match your mobility they've got shielded they've got healing they've got armor um they don't really have the hard to wound but like it's very very difficult for you to just power through that level of mitigation and healing um, and they can yeah, well, keep no, step for step with for you. as much damage as like a depleted. You know, there's a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So when so let's say you're you're at an event and you've got basically your entire collection of models that you play routinely. What makes you reach for a Masaki crew? When when do you really like to put them on the table? So I think they're really good in situations where you want to spread out and your opponent wants to spread out. Because when you're spreading out so much, your opponent's generally going to be taking like some faster minions, especially if it's like corner or something. And those minions tend to be a little less durable than others. And like we discussed earlier in the episode, the nice part about Misaki is you can commit her to one end of the table to get some work done and then be on the next end of the table the very next turn. Uh, So there's no real committal, so to speak, in what Misaki does in any of her turns because of her flexibility on where can she can be on the table. So things like your covert ops on like corner, she's really good at those um, because you can very often score two or three or, you know, you, you can get pretty close to four points on strat very easily just by nature of being able to score those, you know, inner points, you know, fight for those pretty hard, mm-hmm. but also playing the denial on the outer ones. So your opponent doesn't get those. Um, and then, She's just really good against soft targets in general. Like yeah. when you're playing into factions where you know they're not going to have a bunch of armor or a bunch of hard to wound, uh, you can very easily get in there, take out some soft targets, and then be pretty reasonably content that if your opponent's going to put time in trying to deal with your master, they're going to usually be wasting that time. Like Neverborn's a pretty good example of where you might take Misaki because they don't yeah. tend to pile on armor all too much. They're generally very melee focused and, you know, you can just go in there, one shot the Sillerate or whatever that Zerate is trying to play and then just be pretty scot-free. Yeah, I mean, the the factions that I tend to be the most comfortable playing her into are like going to be like Bayou, Neverborn, um, you know, Explorers most of the time I feel pretty okay with. There's a couple that I definitely am like, she might not be the right pick. Like if I'm going into Rezzers, like, oof, man, there that there's so many bad matchups in that faction for her crew. <laughs> it's, yeah, Rezzers Guild Arcanist, I'd probably avoid Misaki on. Yeah. Outcast, she can be pretty decent into as well. Yeah, Arcanist's so. a real hit or miss. Like if you get if your opponent declares the masters that she can play into, then she's gonna be okay. Um, but with how good some of her real strong counters are um like if you do happen to play into like a mayfang or a um hoffman Hoffman, like man bad 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 time (laughs) 
yeah and like like aside from those specific matchups like just rezzers in general are kind of a problem for her um she definitely doesn't want to be looking at like a von stuck on the other side of the table because that is a horrific game for her like yeah, hard to wound already makes it difficult for you to get the straight flips but rezzers in general just usually have inflated wound counts so you aren't yeah. even really getting the one shots exactly. off that you really want to look for um yeah, and if you if you look at something like Stuck, it's like, oh, they've got the total package because they've got hard to wound and they've got armor and they can hand out stun to get rid of all the triggers that I super duper want and they've got high wound counts and Valedictorian can get pretty much anywhere she wants on the table. Like, this is not good. It's not good. Yeah, not, not a great time. <laughs> no, definitely not. Um, so in terms of the what other crews within the Ten Thunders faction do you think she kind of falls into the same niche with? So there's a lot of decently fast spread out crews within the faction. I think one of the things I struggle with right now is that Yoko is kind of like my pet master, Yoko yeah. too. Yeah. And past tokens let you play those types of scenarios pretty cagey while still being able to score and deny well. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that Misaki also gets past tokens is very nice for that same reason, but there's some overlap there. Yeah. She's definitely way faster than Yoko, but in the current gaining grounds, I don't think you need that level of mobility. Mm -hmm. If that changes with our next gaining grounds, maybe they don't have quite so much overlap. But that's part of the headspace that I have to wonder. And then as far as having your assassin that you're willing to like dive into the enemy crew and do disruption with, I think Jacob Lynch's, you know, yeah. Huggy gets to do a very similar role as Misaki 1 does but you just get to guarantee that you have a much better hand of cards when you do it. Right. And if they do happen to kill your, you know, Huggy, which you're allowed to leave in there and just keep disrupting with, unlike Misaki one, then he just revives back at Jacob Lynch. Right. Yeah. It's very so low like, risk and you can support it with the, to your point, the cards and all that. Yeah. yeah so like for the two play styles where you're either trying to, you know, wait for your opponent to spread out and then snipe their tiny little models or the I want to dive in and assassinate something. I feel like you have other bases in the faction that can do it a little bit more consistently. Mm -hmm. But for like your your three rounders, your five rounders where you want to play something different every round, it's still nice to be able to do that twice. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I feel like for my stable of masters, she fits very very well because like i don't i don't really have the experience with some of the others that would kind of fill that same role i play yoko but not to the same degree as you i really need more practice with her um i don't own lynch yet i haven't really played him so like for what i have she does a job that i need doing i for would sure. i my last question to you would be and of course i'm gonna ask this where does she fall in the 10 Thunders tier list? Oh boy. If I recall back when we originally ran the 10 Thunders tier list, I think we gave her the only B tier, which to, uh, you know, kind of break down the tiers. There was mm -hmm. S tier, which was the, the best of the best. Uh, you know, this competes with the strongest stuff in the game and, you know, maybe needs to be knocked down a level, maybe doesn't, but it's the very least, you know, you should expect to see this in tournaments. There was the A tier, which is the, you know, if your opponent's not declaring the, the most broken thing, it's probably one of these things in the next tier down that you could reasonably expect, either because they have a better pool or matchup than the S tier one did. And then there was the B tier masters, which are like the... You wouldn't, like, laugh at someone if they put, brought this keyword to the game. <laughs> like, you're still going to play a game of Malifaux against them. But there's enough bad matchups or, like, stuff that's covered in the higher tiers that they already do that you wouldn't necessarily want this to be the only master in your bag. Um, and that's where I feel like she comfortably falls in that, yeah. you know, she's uh, a decent yeah. master for like starting the game. And I think she's an excellent foray into the faction for just like getting you a feel of thematically how it is kind of the neat tricks that the faction can do and getting you an idea of generally how thunders work. But, you know, she's not the apex of the faction, if you will. No, no, she's, I would agree if I had to put her on a tier list, I'd put her B. If there were other masters in B tier, 
I would probably put her at the high end of B because I do think she's pretty strong and in the hands of somebody who's practiced with her can be a real threat to most opponents unless you roll into a really bad matchup. Um, if I were splitting it out between Misaki 1 and Misaki 2, I would put them basically right next to each other. I don't necessarily think that one version is significantly better than the other. Um, but yeah, I, I would say B tier for, for both versions is where I would put them as well. I like that. Yeah, I like Misaki 2 a little bit less than you, just because I find that she has the same card requirements that you know Masaki mm-hmm. one does but doesn't recover them as well and doesn't get quite the same effect yeah but you know i need to tool around with it right. a bit more the one thing i will say that's nice about her is if you do i mean the berry mechanic crews are relatively rare um but you know outcasts are a, are a, key, a faction that i would say Masaki one can comfortably play into and if you do happen to roll into the tara matchup you're not just completely screwed. Um, you can choose not to bury, which is probably not great, uh, or you can just play Misaki too and and have a, a real game of it. So, and Shang is actually a reasonable counter tech to the entire matchup, yes. to be honest. Absolutely, because Tara Absolutely. one wants to or Tara wants to bury your stuff too, and having the ability to just pop it back out where you want it is not a bad option. No, no, not at all. Cool. I think that pretty much wraps it up. We've been going on for quite some time here. Um, any final parting thoughts, or are you ready to bid the good people adieu? Uh, thanks for you know listening the whole time. Yeah. Uh, if you enjoyed our brief tiering of Misaki and the rest of the Thunders, feel free to check out the entire tier listing on the Danger Planet YouTube channel. Yeah, I'll make sure wow. I include a link to it in the show notes. Fantastic. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Jesse. It was great uh, yeah. riffing with you on this. Uh, you know, I appreciated you loaning me your Misaki models at Captain Con <laughs> for that, Scorpius. Hell yeah. Um, yeah, she's a good time. She is. She is. And this is a this is a, an episode that I've literally been talking about recording for probably the better part of a year and just other episodes keep getting put in front of it in the queue. I'm really, really happy that we've we finally put this one to bed, so to speak. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to playing her in Houston and getting absolutely stomped by all the other super aggressive players that basically counter her play style, which is going to be fantastic. Um, Yeah. So with all that said, keep your conversations boring and stay weird. Stay weird.